Okay, we will now st start the agenda back. So now the item on the agenda is number 17, call to order, roll call to establish a quorum. So I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson so that we can reestablish a quorum. Yes, good morning. I'll begin with the roll call of the chair. Madam Chair? Yeah. Madam Chair is present. Vice Chair Brown? Present. Vice Chair Brown is present. Uh, Member Bradford? Here. Member Bradford is present. Member Grills? Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder? Here. Member Holder is present. Member uh, Joan Sawyer? Member Joan Sawyer is absent. Member Lewis? Member Lewis is present. Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. And Member Tamaki. Here. Member Tamaki is present. Madam Chair, there are nine members, <clears throat> excuse me, on the task force. The number necessary for a quorum is five. There are eight members present. A quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been established, we'll now turn to the next item on the agenda. First, welcome. Thank you, City of San Diego. I know we have a hard stop at 5 p.m., so I would like to take the time now to thank City Council Member and Task Force Member Monica Montgomery Stepp for hosting us. This is a great turnout. Also, thank you, Shauna Charles from the Charles Communication Group for also uh, contributing to this great turnout as well. Okay, so now we will go to uh, item number 18, which is public comment. And I know there is a, a, a list of folks. <laughs> so uh, is Malcolm, he Malcolm, is Malcolm here? Henry Wallace, you said, well, hey, it's fine. We don't even have to do it. We'll just go. Um, I know Malcolm, Henry Wallace, Yusuf Miller, Dana Dorsey, Lauren Jenkins, Nita Watson, and Chris Lodson of CJEC are the first seven. So, so now, okay, we can proceed with public comment. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so we'll do 40 minutes if we can quiet down just to hear the uh, public comment instructions We'll again like yesterday do 40 minutes of in-person public comment and 20 minutes on the phone lines All right, and each person has about two minutes to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, Miss Aisha Martin Walton Justice and the task force does definitely want to hear from everyone. As the chair said, there's one hour, you have two minutes each, and just be advised in fairness to everyone that you may be politely interrupted. So with that, we will go ahead and begin. First commenter. All right. Welcome. Good morning, beautiful people. Hello. Um, well, I, I, yesterday when we uh, public comment got cut off, I, I thought it was really fitting that uh, my elder came on and and he mentioned how he was enslaved in the South, and he was in his 80s, and here I am, I'm in my 30s, and I was enslaved in the California Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. So we see generational trauma via mass incarceration, chattel slavery, you know, tomato, tomato. Um, as we know, America is one of the wealthy, wealthiest nations in the world. And as we also know, a large percentage of that wealth can be traced to the profits made off of slave labor. And even some of the most prestigious universities, even this one that I'm actually a graduate student at right now, has benefited from anti-black racism. And San Diego State, as much as, I, as much as I enjoy and love this school, they still perpetuate a certain level of anti-black racism. And as we also know, America has a, a huge problem with uh, criminal justice, mass incarceration. Anybody that, that commits a crime is mandated to pay restitution. Anybody that's been convicted of a crime, even if you have no victims, they're going to mandate restitution on you because of your crime that was committed against the people. 
and our people have been had 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 major crimes committed against us. We're due res, re, reparations, and um, what we want is what we want is wealth. And how I define wealth is that which money cannot buy, and which man cannot confiscate. Which money can't buy and man can't confiscate. Good health, generational wealth, knowledge in the form of good quality education. A payout is a good place to start, but it's not the generation of, of true wealth. So I just want to say that we, we, we should be expanding our thoughts of how reparation looks and how, how, how this payment is um, allocated. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, Task Force, for the work that you're doing. My name is Henry Wallace. I'm chairman of San Diego Original Black Panther Party. We were founded and created here at San Diego State in 1967. And uh, we recently celebrated our 55th anniversary here, whereas we reactivated in 2017 to create uh, survival programs for the people so that our poor people can still have food and stuff like that. And we also take care of the homeless as well. Uh, we recently uh, reconciled with the US organization for those that know the history of the Black Panther Party and US through Dr. Milana Karinga, the founder of US and the founder of Kwanzaa. Uh, I was told by him and Vernon Sakuma, which was uh, the director here at uh, uh, San Diego for uh, the US organization to speak on their behalf. And uh, we talked about the 10 point platform that the Black Panther Party has, which is still a good platform for the task force to look at to try and expand, like uh, Malcolm said, the. Uh, 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 reparations, but what we came up with, uh, we need free health care, uh, free psychological uh, care based on the damage that was due, done by uh, systemic racism, free land due for us, being our labor who has historically been low-balled and free, whereas we were stolen from our country where we probably would have had our own land and our own wealth, we feel that this state and the country need to give us land uh, also, uh, free education based on the standards of the Black Panther Party 10-point platform that show the true nature of our lives as far as who we were prior to coming here and the things that we built in this nation. Also, we need to have a... Uh, uh, um, uh, Excuse me, sir. <laughs> I'm so we sorry also, to interrupt you in the we middle of also, your sentence. It's supposed to be three minutes. You're giving uh, us no, two, minutes. two minutes. It's two minutes you, today. But you said three minutes. Thank you, sir. There. We have to move we on. Thank you, okay. so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Feel free to submit yeah, your comments in writing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Christina Griffin Jones. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm with the California Black Power Network. Uh, I'm speaking today on the uh, limitations uh, uh, or the issues, I'm sorry, with lineage. Um, the lineage requirement, as it currently exists, right, it doesn't necessarily exclude non-black people who can trace their lineage. The lineage requirement also uh, provides a challenge in tracing lineage uh, that can be a really issue for some folks who are descendants, um, including people who've been impacted by foster care systems, people who have lost records due to national disasters and in other events like, fr uh, like fires. And this uh, places um, like a, it makes it so that Freedmen's Bureaus cannot recreate these documents that have been destroyed in order to help people prove their lineage. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. Next speaker, please. Good morning. Good morning. For the record, my name is Laurie Jenkins and I'm with some grassroots organizers, uh, NAASDLA, as well as SUJEC. And I want to thank the task force members for the work that you guys are putting in, uh, sacrificing their time. However, I did want to say that I was, I'm quite disappointed in 
um, the repeated attempts by certain members of the task force to expand the scope of eligibility. Uh, Dr. Weber stood right here yesterday and reiterated what her legislative intent was, and I see it as an act of disrespect to continuously try to expand by using terminologies such as um, uh, inclusive and, and you know disadvantaged communities. And I think that we just, instead of inserting our self-serving agendas and, and trying to carry that out, we, we need to uh, respect what the legislative intent was. The eligibility standard has already been established. Um, there are multiple ways in order to trace your lineage. Um, and I think that uh, we need to focus on making sure the policy proposals are specific and lineage focused. And we, we will be paying attention to every line of every uh, piece of legislation to make sure that in what the IT world we call there's no scope creep. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Chris Lawson. Just one of the lead organizers with the Coalition for Just and Equitable California. I have had the pleasure of meeting with, I think, almost every single one of you, so I'm not going to speak for too long. But I want to say a couple of things. First, I want to speak to you, and then I'm sort of, I also want to speak to the folks behind me, too, and the folks that are watching publicly. First thing to you, I want to thank you, each and every single one of you, for your time, for your sacrifice. I know this is tough work. This is God's work. You're putting in time, hours for zero pay, and this is hard. And you're doing something that's never been done before. Each one of you, there's never been somebody like you in the position that you're in because we've never done something like this before. So I want to appreciate each and every single one of you for every single year. Right, 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 definitely. Show them some love. Show them some love. Secondly, to the everybody. We in a, as uh, James Brown said, uh, we in a very critical and crucial time right now for the reparations movement. A very sensitive time. There are powerful forces organizing right now to stop what we're going to do. Now is the time to be working together, to be loving on each other, to be connecting with each other, and not tearing each other apart. Now is the time to work together. Last thing I'll say is, Thank you for voting for lineage-based reparations eligibility. Uh, please do more, right on, right on. Please do more for reparations to combat reparations misinformation. I want to also thank you again for acknowledging us as a specific group of people, those who descend from U.S. slavery. The Office of Management and, or Office of Management and Budget with the U.S. Census just yesterday or just last week released their initial proposals for how they might change the 2030 U.S. Census. And they said, one of their first things they said is, disaggregate the black slash African-American category and create a specific place and a specific space for those who descend from U.S. slavery. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Next speaker. Greetings. Greetings. Uh, Brother Assembly, I think you stepped out yesterday when I mentioned about the two prisons that you shut down in California. Um, I, I, I asked for you guys to propose something that's releasing our prisoners so we can have our own staff there so we can rehabilitate them ourselves because that's one of the part of the uh, reparations is to rehabilitate. Now the last one would be never again. That's uh, the last part of reparations. How is it going to be never again when we have 250 plus militia groups here in America? Ukraine was harboring them when they was getting felonies. They was running over there and, and, and God be the glory. They thought they was going to come back and do the revolution against us, but Russia bit them. So we're saying that here in California, we have Ram, Rise Up, or whatever, right, whatever. Those guys exist. We got all these white militia groups here, and how are we going to feel safe? They're already doing as they did us in, in Buffalo. They, they, a, young, uh, uh, a young guy shot 10 people. They were just going to the grocery store. So how are we going to feel safe once we get all this money? I see how we're going to be, we're gonna, I, see, I tell you how we're going to be real safe. We're going to be like the natives. We want our own land. Do all y'all want to live with the white people? You can live with them. But I want to go back to my hood and live with all black people. Recycled my money for 30 days. You know, recycle. And not just no, we don't want just no uh, 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 casinos. We have 75 black Wall Streets. We can do it. Just give us the land. Y'all can figure the money out later. Okay, so uh, another thing, UCLA, the Bunch Center. I mean, first of all, that's disrespectful. It should be the Bunchy Carter and John Huggins Center. Because they was assassinated there by... 
Not COINTEL PRO. Now, are you guys scared of these people? The FBI, the CIA, or whatever? They come in our neighborhood and shoot at us too. When y'all gonna stop? When y'all gonna point the finger at them? Come on, uh, Camilla, how, where you at? Camilla, uh, uh, the VP. You put all us blacks in jail here in California. Why don't you go after these white people? This not no unsolved mystery. This, is, this mystery's been solved. Y'all just have to go and get these crooks. They're the ones who turned us into it. We had social clubs back in the days. Excuse me, sir. I'm so sorry. Thank, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your sentence. Thank you so much for your powerful statement. Next speaker, please. Begin, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm Morris Griffin. I'm better known as Big Money Griff, strong community activist, leader, and problem solver. And I want to thank each and every one of you that are in the audience, the immediate audience, and those of you listening to the sound of my voice. Madam Chair, members of the board, I rise in giving honor to Miss Dr. Shirley Weber for being the point person for why we are here today, bringing us AB 3121. Thank you, Shirley Weber, for doing that, Secretary of State. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention to Governor Gavin Newsom Governor Gavin Newsom, there's an old saying in California, so goes California, so goes the nation. And so you, we understand that you're getting ready to run for the presidency, for the United States presidency. We as black African Americans call it the United Snakes of America. But we want you to be aware of the fact that if you give us or when you give us reparations to the day we die, $5,000 to $10,000 tax-free, we will make sure that we spread the word, what we heard, and you will never look back when it comes to you running for the presidency. I don't know if you've ever seen the Million Man March. I don't know if you realize that it was the million women that got Joe Biden elected. All I'm saying to you is that we see our young babies breaking in, busting and, and, and stealing uh, snack foods out of 7-Eleven stores because they don't have any chump change, because they don't have any money from their parents giving them, giving them uh, allowances. We've got to, we're better than this. We were the first best friends white folks ever had in America for over 400 years. I gotta say that because that's real true. That's true. We are the first best friends, white folks. We built, our ancestors built this nation. And for you to say, don't say that, something's wrong with you in that regard. Because it's not about what they want to know. It's about what we need to know. That's Sir, why I'm here. Excuse me. Thank See, now you, you got so me off much. on you. Thank you so much for your comments this morning. Thank you for coming out and sharing with the task force. Next speaker, please. Okay, I can boom, I can do production work. Anyway, um, good morning, I'm Friday Jones. My name is Consul Jones Muhammad. Chris Logson is really my brother in arms. I don't know what he had last night, but I'm on the same vibe. Um, you all are doing historic work. You are doing unprecedented work. The world has never seen this before. The report that you issued in the timeliness in which you got it published and out is phenomenal. You all have been phenomenal. In the reparation space, there are generational differences in opinion on how this is supposed to go. You have, like Martin Luther King, one of the youngest uh, revolutionary reparationists leading this task force. You all, in the generations of your walk, the time that you have been on this earth, have to support her, and you all have to support each other. You all have work to do, and we as a community, this descendant community, we are counting on you. We are facing zero wealth in 2053, and COVID has made that time line shorter. We respect you. We appreciate you. May God bless you so that you can see us to the end of this work. Thank you so much for my time. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Next speaker, please. Good morning. Good morning. 
Good morning, good morning. I would like to thank Friday and Chris for those. Can you speak into the mic a little more? Step a little. I closer. would like to thank Friday, Jones, and Chris for those very encouraging words. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, and the entire California Reparation Task Force members. My name is Darlene Crumity. I am a member of the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, as well as the American Redress Coalition of California Bay Area. My gratitude knows no bounds for what you have already accomplished and what is to come as you push forward with the California Reparations Bill for the American descendants of chattel slavery, also known as Freeman. With that being said, I implore the task force to do more to counteract all the misinformation, disinformation that's being blasted across social media. This harms our push for California reparations. And I would like to thank you all for your amazing work on the interim report that was sent out on June 22. I'm in the process of doing a deep dive, or what I like to call close reading of this work, meaning that I'm taking notes, I'm talking to it, and I will uh, comprise a list of the, my entire analysis of it when you are in Sacramento. But in the meantime, I would like to commend you on the excellent write-up starting on page 56 to 57 of the Three Friends Compromise. Because unfortunately, people just don't understand what that means and how it still affects us today. So thank you so much for that. But I totally disagree on page 41 with the substitution of the term slave to enslave or the substitution of the words owner and master to enslave persons. This, in my opinion, it just takes the sting out of brutality of the slavery system. And one of the laws that was used against the black slave was called the Fugitive Law, Slave Act. It was not the Fugitive Enslave Act. And words really do matter. Excuse me. Let's not be racist. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. So and I look forward to, to seeing you in Sacramento. Thanks for coming out. Next speaker. Good morning, my name is Jacqueline Clark, and thank you for all the hard work and diligence that you put into to this effort. It is overwhelming, I know. I'm just gonna pick up from where I left off yesterday. Since you're providing recommendations to the federal government in your summaries and findings, Negroes should be included. However, HR 4238 prevents it from being included in federal forms and in federal legis legislation. We need to have that amended because there cannot be a conversation about reparations without Negro. If the OMB is serious, they will lead the charge internally because some of us identify as Negro and HR 4238 prevents it from being used. So they need to do the work internally to make sure that it will be able to be included because they are saying that you can include Negro and Haitian on this form, but if Negro is precluded from being in federal forms, the OMB has to do the work to make sure that it's gonna be accepted. When you're introducing your suggestions or recommendations and in your footnotes, Please make sure that there is a conversation and effort to amend H.R. 4238, and that amendment would be to include Negro in the conversations for reparations and to remove it from being deemed outdated or offensive. Since Congress has the authority under Article I, Section 8 to make amendments, please consider, con sincerely consider recommending that they amend H.R. 4238 to state that in the case of reparations, and in the case of preserving Negro history, they must reinsert the term Negro in federal language. Many of us gladly and proudly identify as Negro. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Good morning. Um, you can raise the mic a little bit for you, so there you go. Good morning. I'm grateful to be here. My name is Ivy Jean. I am the president of Africa, a nonprofit corporation that empowers black people, African Americans, through travel. Our goal is to advocate for reparations in the form of free education and free travel. I'm currently enrolled at Trade Tech in their community planning uh, and development program. My instructor is Benjamin Torres, and he I told him I was coming today, and he specifically said that I should meet you, Ms. Grills, 
Dr. Grills. And I'm hoping that you guys will consider my program as a part of uh, the initiatives that will go forward. Um, I believe that education should be free to all African Americans and that we, uh, through travel, we can gain experiences that we haven't had uh, naturally um, to celebrate Africans worldwide. We're everywhere and we should be able to see that and hopefully uh, through my program that is uh, the goal. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Edwin Kendrick. I'm a vascular surgeon uh, in the Los Angeles County area. I also run a healthcare technology company that focuses on health equity. I also serve as president-elect of a uh, medical society here in California. One of the things that I'm bringing to you is uh, on yesterday, I ended up transferring to the governor's office a statement which includes a coalition letter from at least seven medical societies, seven community-based organizations, multiple pipeline trainee residents and students across seven states. That was done in seven days because many of us were unaware of what was happening with the task force. Around December, I read your report and thought it was elaborate, it was extensive, thorough, and great. Here's a couple of things I like to mention. Um, California does need to set the standard for health care equality. That's what we're about. Methods and practices which dismantle current obstacles in health equity. The foundations include what I call STEAM 2 education because we need to have arts as well as medicine. Number two, pipeline trainee support, a physician retention system. The stats are tech fields, we make up 2% of the population. Medical school graduates, 6% of the population. Physicians in the state, 2.7 to 3% of the population. 29% of us will face discrimination with 40% of us either trying to leave the field and never working. These are the problems that we face in California. Within this letter, as a coalition, we deal with STEAM education beyond the walls of the school, solutions including a pipeline from kindergarten all the way through the professional career, including research, and measuring systemic factors which involve physicians and our ability to be able to retain physicians, particularly as they are commonly involved with self-governing issues within medical facilities and hospitals. I leave this report for you. I hope that you take it, that you read it, because there are solutions in there practical, which the governor has seen for years. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, feel free to adjust the mic. There you go. Feel free to adjust the mic for your okay. comfort. Oh, thank you. Uh, hello, greetings. My name is Ahmed Mullins. I am a descendant of a slave, farmer, Juris Doctorate, pol former police officer, Army cadet, and currently a janitor in the um, city of San Diego from discrimination that I've experienced in the job market. I have all this education and I'm out here sweeping floors and I don't think, I, no discouragement to anyone who sweeps floors, it's an honorable profession, but what I am saying is that reparations are gonna mean nothing if we do not do something in the interim about the discrimination and things that we're experiencing here today and right now because there will not be an increase of wealth or a continuance of wealth if we don't do something about what's happening right now. All of my young black friends right now are not even considering starting families from how terrible it is out here, including myself. Mm -hmm. And there won't be a continuance, there won't be a bloodline, there would be no generational wealth without the ability to create a new generation. And I'm so sorry if, I, if I'm, I'm angry today. Uh, my grandmother was murdered by a white EMT worker in Tennessee. He was caught on video cam saying he would not perform CPR on a nigger. And no, zero dollars was given to my family. No one was fired for this. No one was held accountable for what happened to my grandmother. And me, I was leaving law school one night and I was dragged out of my vehicle and falsely accused of DUI. I blew a point zero 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 one and grabbed, thrown down by the neck onto the ground, dragged through the streets and embarrassed, humiliated. And now, even though I don't have a criminal record, I'm now having to put whenever I apply for a job that I've been arrested. And I'm really angry about 
the things that this city is doing and some of the things that they're not doing to help our communities because even if reparations is possible, nothing else is going to be possible if we don't do something to stop the systematic discrimination that we're experiencing in our day-to-day -day lives right now. Thank, thank you. Thanks so very much for coming out. Next speaker. Peace to the ancestors. Peace to the tribe. No need to stand on ceremony here. I'm a black American that's indigenous to this land. This land, this land. Not pan-African land, not Negro land, and per paperwork and genealogy, I'm not a free man, period. Point blank, period. So let's get that the fuck up out of here. I'm sick of hearing that. Hate speech, not at all. This is defense and delineation, honestly. So with that being said, if I take a trip to the Caribbean, I'm in knowledge as a Yankee. When I take a trip to the continent, I am acknowledged as a lazy Akata. They delineated a long time ago. It's our time now. So, eligibility record, <laughs> recommendations goes as follows. Living in California at the signing of the bill, passing tech, uh, paying taxes at the time bill was signed, and lineage based only. Lineage based only reparations for black Americans that was harmed due to American chattel slavery. All right, cut the bullshit, cut the checks. Vote with Dion Jenkins, and I will see all of you in Sacramento. I land. Thank you. Next speaker. Morning, Task Force. Morning, black community, my beautiful black people. My name is Jay. I run a black-owned social media site, Six Zeros. And I wanted to talk to the community today. Thank you. All right, if your family was not kidnapped in Africa, brought across the Atlantic Ocean and subjugated to hundreds of years of the most vile and inhumane treatment in this country, I want to let you know that I believe you. Same with the Moors. If your family didn't make that trek across the Atlantic Ocean to be subjected to hundreds of years of the most vile and disgusting treatment that we still suffer from today, then yes, I believe you. But there's one thing that you have to understand, and that this is not about you. On March 29th, 2022, they, they, they made the determination that eligibility is going to be based on lineage, which is descendant of American chattel slavery. And if you are not okay with that, it is your opportunity to make your own CJEC, your own NAASD, to advocate for your own people. If you're not proud to be a black American or a descendant of American chattel slavery, it's your job to advocate for your people and stop trying to ride on our backs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Yeah. Take your time. My name is Bishop Williams, and and I said yesterday I am a real slave. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, here's what I want to say today. I have done my research and studies on reparation for 50 years, and you are using some of it on the task force, okay? And all of the money, that's what I'm going to speak on, money that belong to all of us, all, and all the peoples in here. You know, and I would like to hear something about the money because I've seen so much of the money that uh, my people didn't get and what happened to them and how they were murdered and, and how they were hung and everything, and how the slave masters got paid money from the insurance company for hanging blacks right here in this country. So I would like to talk about the money, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Freeman B. Row. And also the 40 acres and a mule, which was um, uh, 40 acres and a mule, that was 100,000, 30,000 acres of land given in each state. Okay? Now, that money is not 40 acres and a mule no more. It's 40 acres and a tractor. Okay? For each family. Okay? That's, that's what it is. That's where, that's where I put it. But I'm going to try. But that billions and billions of dollars that's on the black people because of all of this and the money they didn't get because of the 
me and U.S. Mrs. Grant had a meeting. That's how the end of the Civil War ended. They had a meeting. Okay, we want the money that had been passed by Congress coming down for blacks. We want that. And the only way we can get it, we got to kill Lincoln. Five days later, they killed Lincoln. So let's talk about the money. And the last thing, I heard two men here speaking yesterday on money, okay? And then they didn't have nothing to do with this up here, what y'all doing, you know? And they're speaking to y'all about money that they want. I know, I know what it was going, okay? But see, that was wrong. Somebody should have cut them off. And they're not going to speak about rep to y'all about reparation money. They shouldn't be speaking. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be speaking. You know? Bishop, I'm, I'm so sorry. Mind, thank, okay? thank you for your comments so, and for coming back again today. Everybody's mind was closed. The task force always wants to hear listen, from you. Listen, listen. I want y'all to just listen and everything and watch what's going on here because there's a lot of slave masters and some of them sitting on the sideline. And I'm there. But they'll advise you all if you let them. They'll advise you. Okay? Don't give them too much. This, no, thank, thank you, Pastor. This that and everything like this. Bishop, thank you this so time, much. You know. If you would like to provide more camp comments, we would be ha happy to help you craft them, draft them, and um, so anything we can do to Yeah, I know what happened yesterday. And, and help you. But, and but, you but, but thank you so much. Thanks for coming out again today. And for taking the time. Uh, just a quick check-in, Chair Moore and Task Force. It's 9.47. We have about 10 more minutes, given your instructions for in-person comments. Next speaker, Hi. please. Hi, my name is Syra Evans. I'm a founding member of San Diego March for Black Women. Um, I wanted to first recognize the history of there were at least 6 million Negroes leaving the South at the end of slavery. So you're talking about it counting for at least the descendants of 6 million people. First of all. And then second, I wanted to just address that. I don't see any language in y'all's platform addressing black trans folks. And that's something that needs to be addressed because oppression is layered. Is that not true? Is oppression not layered? And so when we're talking about black people who are living in America, who are a subjugated people, we're talking about people who are dealing with layers of oppression, not just anti-black oppression, but we are talking about trans oppression, we are talking about immigrant oppression, right? So there is a lot of language in here, but then there's also a lot of language that's not present. And so I just want that to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out, and thank you for your contributing words. Next speaker. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Task Force. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Ted Womack. I'm a Civic Engagement Manager with Alliance San Diego. I also sit on the Coalition for Police Accountability and Transparency. Um, I want to talk to you all about accessibility today. I know that we've talked a lot about, and you've heard a lot about people being oppressed by law enforcement, but it goes so much deeper than a lot of people even know. Since I was about 15 or 16, I've been surveilled by police for no reason. I've seen the pictures. My elders have came and told me that they would look at me in the neighborhood, they would look at our friends in the neighborhood for no reason. And then as I got older, I would see those pictures of them taking pictures of us as teenagers, as kids in the neighborhood. My first police contact incident was of a cop telling me, you can't play basketball here at this YMCA because there's fights going on. As a fight is happening behind him, as they kick me out, they follow me home. I refuse to let them follow me home and they arrest me for impeding an investigation. Then no nothing happened. I didn't do anything. And this is the case for millions of teens in California. And I know that in California, we look at a little bit of a different situation because California is technically a free state, right? But so, so, so many black people and people of color are enslaved by law enforcement. We go through these uh, conditions and situations so many times that people don't understand it. They have a, a, a gang force where we have infants on there. How does that even make sense? How is an infant on a gang injunction list? It's just a long, 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 long list of oppression that we've gone through from law enforcement. Um, so when we're talking about reparations and accessibility, I ask that you all look at 
the oppression that law enforcement has put on us throughout these years and look at the multiple levels that that has held us back to. I'm sure an infant who was on the gang injunction list can't trace their lineage. They can't do anything about that. So we need to make clauses or make some type of voice for them because they're suffering too from things that they have no control over and they can't do anything about. Um, so thank you, thank you for your time. Excuse me, sir, before you speak, thank you. Just to check in, Chair Moore, there are five more minutes per the task force's instructions, and we have 25 people on the line. Please, please, please. We have please about until 10.30 uh, to work with, so. Please, not for me, but for all these people here. So, yeah, we Send still it. have a, we still have, like, 30 minutes left, to be honest. So be let's just get through this, and then um, we'll go to the phone line. So. Okay, next speaker. You have two minutes, please. We're starting Good morning. Now. Good morning. Good to see everybody. God bless you. I think I'm familiar with everybody here, and I think you're familiar with me. Uh, just to say who mm -hmm. I am for the record, Reverend Tony Pierce, and I'm the CEO of Black Wall Street Project, and we're about economic empowerment and justice for all our people. And we're a global organization. We're fighting in Australia for the Aborigines, Canada, Mexico, everywhere. So anyway, uh, my background, Cal State University, Pacific University Theology, Business and Economics from Cal State. So I know what we're talking about. Uh, what I wanna do is just give a little bit of a breakdown here on the things that we're missing, the things you don't know. Health needs to be a part of your agenda. Our people have died, died, because they couldn't get health benefits. So we need to research that area and find out all the people that have died through the years and uh, couldn't get the health benefits. I can't take long now. I want to request that I be brought back as an expert speaker. So, yeah, for the things that are for uh, uh, real estate and et cetera, my family's been the victim through those areas of uh, prejudice and discriminatory practices, but we need to move it up past 1977 today. There's predatory, discriminatory practices. They foreclosed on black people's homes, and we need to get current with this. So, we have to move forward. God bless you. And the wealth gap needs to be included with what we're doing. The wealth gap is not included. Oh, lastly, God bless the mayor of San Diego, but I'm upset. Why doesn't he have a reparation task force here in San Diego? Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Pierce. The, the, the woman with the gray sweater, just you're going to be the last person, so no more in person after her. Thank All right. You. Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. It's Chantel Jatachi Bacon again. Um, I want to um, first give reverence to um, April Valentine, who is a 30-year-old woman who recently died at Sentinella Hospital. Um, she's currently under investigation, but she presented a pregnant woman first time and now she's no longer with her family. So I just want to make sure her name is in the record when we talk about medical bias. Um, there's going to be a lot of work behind this because our people do not get the, uh, the care that they need when they present with pain. She was ignored and she died as a result of it. Again, I want to um, highlight some prominent figures here in San Diego. American Newtown, she was a, a, a formerly enslaved woman from Ch um, Kentucky. Um, Isaac Axon, uh, 1892, um, Solomon and Cordelia, sorry, uh, Albert, Albert, Albert Robinson, formerly enslaved person from Missouri, uh, moved here to San Diego, 1887, um, died in 1921, um, Edward Anderson, um, in 1880 through 18, 1890s, on the census, we had um, 55 black African Americans living in the San Diego County, 33 resided in Julian. Julian, uh, you cannot 
they list on their website a lot about the historical uh, area about that, but they exclude African Americans. Um, as we're doing um, the, the five pillars of reparations, one is removing our history. Uh, we have a long history in California, and I want it to be recognized on every single website where there has been historical black families. Gaslamp District, um, there was a lot of black families that live there, African-American families there. There's no reason why you have to go to blackpast.org so to Thank find this out. Thank you so much. Out. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Next speaker, please. My name is Shamika Hamilton, and I am a current resident of Corona, California, in the Empire, which uh, assuming that you guys have forgotten about because we didn't get a meeting. Um, and I don't think we're going to get a meeting. And most of the black people were pushed out to San Bernardino County. So you guys forgot about us on that. And I want to speak about the requirements. I moved here in 2015 from Georgia. Um, my family is a direct, well, I am a direct descendant of chattel slavery. My grandmother was used as a breeder. Um, my brother was murdered in Wilcox State Prison um, in 2020. Um, hold on, I, I got to show you this because they told us that my brother fell out of the bed. And this is what he looked like when he fell out of the bed. So for you, I think you said yesterday that if you hadn't been here for 20 years, then you wouldn't be considered for the reparations because you wouldn't be considered as has been harmed by the state of California. I may have not been harmed by the state of California, but my family has been harmed by this country. So I think that if you're considering anyone, you need to consider us all. If we consider ourselves as black Americans because this country was built on our backs. And I have been paying taxes to this state for the last eight years. So I think I should be deserved to, to be on, included on that list. So when you're considering requirements for the reparations, please consider me and my family because I think we've been harmed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thanks for coming out. Next speaker, good morning. Good morning, my name is Velvet Victorian. I'm from South Los Angeles. Actually, I end up growing up in Watts. Um, I've been affected since birth by uh, racism. My mother came here with my grandmother in 1947, and I was born in 1962 in California State Institution for Women. And um, somehow she got involved with heroin. And I mean, by the time I was 35, none of my family was alive. And if it had not been for organizations, and I, I forgot to say, I founded my organization, which is the Velvet Team Rabbit Project, because of my birth situation. And if not for Watts Labor Community Action Committee, and a, another organization called World Christian Training Center, and Job Corps, and the cadets, and a lot of different community organizations, I would have went back to prison. I had 16 points on my driver's license because I used to like to drive new hot red cars. And when I would go through different towns, they would stop me. And it got to a point where, you know, who can afford those tickets? So, um, and during the time after my mother got out of prison, she helped rebuild Watts. So I saw communities that rebuilt themselves. I grew up in a community that through community organizing, Watts changed the whole like, and now it's worse because they're using mass incarceration. And when my mom went to prison, you could go to school. It was considered, I think, um, a correctional. Sometimes um, it wasn't considered a prison. It was more for rehab. It was a rehabilitation center. So instead of us locking people up and rehabilitating them, we're locking them up and making them crazy. And I want to see people not just, and then a lot of my friends, I graduated in 1980. Excuse me so much for One more inter thing. interrupting. Most of the people stuff. don't live here no more that grew up. When I grew Thank up, they you. had to move. They can't afford to stay here no more. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Your, your comments are duly noted. Next speaker, please. All right, he's a little shy. Um, so shout out to 
our strong black sisters who went through incarceration for no reason. Uh, Velvet Chamika's brother, uh, yeah. So mass incarceration is important because the 13th Amendment that you put on your first page, you stated that um, the Supreme Court interpreted the 13th Amendment as empowering Congress to pass all laws necessary and proper for abolishing all badges of incidents of slavery. You know damn well that's a lie. The 13th Amendment was there to mass incarcerate us. As they say, you are criminalized. That's how you become involuntary servitude. So with that being said, the power of legislation, as I repeat, has to be taken very seriously. H.R. 61, Sheila Jackson Lee, no shade to her, but instead of writing a hate uh, speech online where you prevent white supremacy online, where's the hate crime bill to actually protect us when we get reparations from getting a beat down from so-called law enforcement? That's very important. So on H.R. 61, January 9th, it was passed. And on that same day, Brett Favre, you know the one that uh, took $2 million with the welfare fund, that white uh, NFL player? Yeah, he actually sent a cease and desist to Dr. Umar Johnson because he was talking about him on his show, King Kong Consciousness. That's the power of legislation. So when I tell you that it's not you, not think for one second that you're gonna make the final decision. It is us, we the people. And that's why I empower my people to employ you to focus on legislation, on anything you do. Anything you do, they don't expect us to have protection of law. So at the end of the result, Dr. Shane, we appreciate you, but we gotta communicate a little better on this, right? We need to have an anti-black hate crime bill. I don't know how else to explain it. When the reparations come, we need something to protect us, but we appreciate the work each and one of you do. We want to work with you, but don't think you make the final decision. It's us, we the people. Power Thank to you. the people. Thank you so much. Next to last in-person speaker, please take the mic. Uh, how y'all doing this morning? Just raise it a little bit. You can raise the arm. Okay. Uh, thank y'all for having us here. You know, it's a lot of traumatized black individuals in this room, in this world. I come from Louisiana. I seen a man lynch in my time. That was a sad day. I came to California, I've been here 30 years. Nothing has changed. Everywhere I go, I see, you know, we oppress. There's so many homeless in the Bay Area. I, I, feel, I feel so much pity. If we leave this country right now, take every black American from this country right now, it will fucking fall apart. Amen. So I think we need to do something bigger than just give us some money. I don't know how y'all feel, Amen. but I'm tired, I'm fed up. And it ain't nothing we can do because the moment we get the money, they gonna make it impossible before, for us to live with it. So just understand that. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks for coming out this morning. Our last in-person speaker, welcome. Good morning, y'all. My name is Imani Shelton, and I have the pleasure of working with the Riverside County Black Chamber of Commerce uh, to directly combat health disparities amongst the black community. We are also working to close the wealth gap with a promise of uplifting 100 more black businesses and 100 black ho homeowners in the Inland Empire. Uh, the chamber is also working to create a, sta a stable and well-informed network of, black or of other black organizations so that we can educate the public about the news of the reparations. So that we as black people can come together and discuss what we would like to see come from the reparations movement. Reparations is more than just money. Reparations are the promise of long-term sustainable solutions to create uh, permanent fix to the plight of black folks today. We are entirely grateful for your efforts, and we are looking forward to disseminating the information that uh, we are learned from these meetings to our community. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you to all of the in-person folks who came out. Now we will switch to the callers. Uh, David, good morning. This is Aisha. Um, please go ahead and um, open the line for our first caller. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to make a comment, please press one then zero on your phone. Press one then zero on your phone. Our first comment will come from line seven. 
please go ahead. This is Angela Nirvana. With our vote, we've been legislated out of California down from roughly 7 million to 2 million, while immigrants are 10.5 million, illegals 2.3 million. Where is the outrage that this impacts the number of seats we hold in public office, which greatly impacts the decision to pass reparations proposals? Where is the outrage that billions of our reparations dollars are being spent on immigrants while freedmen suffer the highest rates of unemployment, underemployment, and homelessness, and yet you're concerned about the cost for all of us to be compensated for living the vestiges of all five harms, including those who've been legislated out of the state since Newsom signed AB 3121? The only proof that should be required that all American freedmen living in the state of California continue to suffer the vestiges of the five arms and should be paid in full is the 2014 L.A. Color Wealth Report, which states African black with 60,000 liquid to U.S. black $200 liquid eight years ago. While all Japanese were compensated, my ancestors fought and won the Civil War for their emancipation after building the wealthiest country in the world, and the 40 acres and a mule were converted into reparations in 150 years of the Homestead Act for slave owners and white immigrants. It's not our fault. The price for reparations is free. The roof. Every last one of us are old. I'll land there. Thank you. Thank you so much. David, uh, next line, please. Now go to line 13. Your line is now open. Good morning, um, Task Force. My name is Shayla Bonner. I'm the Civic Engagement and Lead Policy Organizer at the Social oh. Trump Project in Contra Costa County. We represent black and brown formerly incarcerated people and those impacted by the criminal legal system. Our mission is to end mass incarceration and re-enfranchise those who have been disenfranchised by the criminal legal system. Thank you all for allowing me to speak today. I believe that all black people and all black Californians deserve reparations because all black people have suffered from anti-black racism and discrimination in the state of California. To me, reparations mean more than just providing financial compensation. California must respect our humanity, rehab, our access to social services, and publicly acknowledge the generational harm it has caused in black residents. Some states are trying to erase black history from our school systems and curriculums instead of acknowledging it, learning from it, and correcting the wrongs that were done, and it's still being done today. As we continue the discussion around reparations, we should also include ownership of land, businesses, and wealth. Wealth is more than just financial compensation. Wealth is also includes health, healing, and freedom. Reparations will not fix everything, but it's a necessary step for black people to begin healing and an opportunity for California government to begin to right the wrongs it has inflicted on the black Californians. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your call. David, next line, please. Now go to line 22. Your line is now open. Hello. My name is Terrence Stewart. I'm with the Kank Kank. And um, I just wanted to make this very clear, starting off, is that when we talk about slaves, we, we, we use this word to, as, as, as a blanket word, but it's still like a negative term within itself. So, like, when we're talking about people, we're talking about people who have families, mothers, fathers, grandfathers, children, cousins, and so much more, people that was inventors, builders, scholars, planters, and so much more, they were people, you know, and people that were sold on the government steps, um, that, um, also people who um, that look at the, the involvement of the CIA and putting crack on our streets, um, also the sentences, the sentence differences between crack and cocaine and the war on drugs that, that followed, um, the prison system that Brother Malcolm talked about and for the first person who spoke, and the collateral consequences of criminal conviction that follows that, that creates what um, Michelle Alexander called the new Jim Crow, but we even the old Jim Crow um, is all a part of why what these reparations is needed. And also the infiltration of black organizations that, that fought for the upward mobility for black people. For example, the United Negro Improvement Association led by Marcus Garvey. 
Um, we need, we deserve represent reparations in, 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 in communities that was targeted and everything that I've mentioned before. We need land ownership so that we can uplift these communities. We need to um, be all to invest in community centers and trauma recovery centers. And we also need monthly payments to the descendants of slaves and everybody who ever suffered to the government hand because of their skin, the color of their skin. Sir, I'm said, so sorry to day, cut. Because the only thing we can is pain. Perfect timing. Thank you so much for your comments this morning. Next uh, line, please, David. <laughs> line 39, your line is now open. Thank you. Um, good morning to the task force. My name is Rose Cannon, and I'm calling from Evanston, Illinois. And we, we are right outside of Chicago. In fact, we, we touch the northern tip of Chicago. I would like to commend the California, the California Task Force for what you're doing. Uh, we approve of everything that's moving forward there. The country is watching. You are the first ones out. Illinois is trying to start up a task force here. We have only seated eight of 18 people. We need more people from the Illinois area to apply for our task force here. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Evanston. We are considered the first uh, city to offer a $25,000 housing allotment, and it's being falsely called reparations. And we are the resistance group here that is fighting in our city to have this stopped or to, to stop this program. We've been unsuccessful because we've been, we're, we're invaded by the likes of NARC and COBRA, First Repair, and IBW-21. And literally, the NAACP is in cahoots with these programs also. I just want everyone to know across the nation, beware of people, beware of these people coming to your city to, to make reparations in your city. They are not reparations. They do not repair. This is basically... Uh, uh, a ploy to take money out of your community. And thank, I thank you for thank allowing you. me to speak. Thank you. you. What's going on in California. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. David, next caller, please. Now go to line nine. Your line is now open. Good morning, Task Force members. My name is Ernest Russell, and I'm calling you today to advocate on behalf of historical Californians who moved from the state I believe to a degree that there would be a miscarriage of justice if the California Task Force was to make a recommendation around residence, residency that would exclude the people who have suffered the historical harms. If you are a descendant who resided in California during the years designated for the harms that are being discussed, I believe you should qualify for said reparations. Now, my next comments are geared towards Lisa Holder's comments yesterday regarding the qualitative analysis. If the economists selected by the California Task Force are not able to quantify harms of black disenfranchisement and subhuman treatment by the jury and the fact the laws in California, I would recommend the task force to consider a qualitative assessment that would enable compensation for the emotional distress and psychological harm suffered by the descendant communities. Now, my very last comments are aimed at Don Tamaki and Senator Bradford. Yesterday, Mr. Tamaki stated that the California task force will not be able to make everyone happy. While I believe that that is true, I think one goal of the task force should, to be should be to garner as much satisfaction as possible from the descendant community. Therefore, legacy Californians who moved from the state, who suffered the harms that are being discussed, should be included in the residency eligibility. Lastly, Senator Bradford mentioned that there would be a need for an agency to have oversight of the residency requirements established. I believe this could easily be achieved by proposing uh, the Office of Freedom and Affairs, which has been mentioned in preliminary recommendations. And then the, my very last comment is that I also think the state should follow the state's guidelines for resident status, which was mentioned by member grills and holders, which is uh, you would be presumed a California resident for any taxable year in which you spent more than nine months in the state. Uh, with that, I am complete. Thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next caller, please, David. Now go to line five. Your line is now open. Uh, hi, this is Eric Christian Ramsey from the Freedman Party. I live in San Francisco and was born in 1994 at Shark Memorial Hospital in San Diego. So I wish I was there with you today. 
My goal is to answer the five key questions in the agenda yesterday. Number one, talking about timeframes, I believe it should be from 1850 to July 1st, 2023, the date at which the task force ends. Number two, talking about California requirement. We all know so goes California, so goes the country. So with that in mind, the only way to maintain the integrity and credibility of state and local reparation task force proposals is to ensure that there is no double dipping, meaning people qualifying for multiple states for multiple local programs. To achieve that, we could take advantage of the fact that everyone was only born in one place. So the idea that I have is that you say if you were born in that state, you're eligible for that state's reparations, for example. And for the small percent of people that were not born within the United States, but are lineage eligible and U.S. citizens, then you go based on where they spent the most amount of time in their life. And then for the small amount of people who have an equal amount of time that they spent, that's the largest, then it'll be based on the most recent one. And then number three, what year determines the beginning of harm? Again, 1850. And then the question, are there different starting points and end points for each atrocity? No. If we use genocide as the unifying harm, just like the U.N. defines reparations in five specific parts, genocide is defined by the United Nations and U.S. in five parts. Lynchings and massacres, killing members of the group, physical or mental harm, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, apartheid deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about a physical destruction in whole or in part, extermination imposing measures- Thank you so much for your call and your comments. I'm so sorry. Feel free to submit them in writing. And again, thank you. David, next caller, please. Now go to line 26. Your line is now open. Good morning. LaDonna Williams. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you for this meeting. But I also want to point out yesterday's presentation from the San Francisco Human Rights Commission that distorted or misrepresented what those of us that are entitled to these reparations requested and recommended. That is, we recommended $5 million to start now while these ongoing endless meetings and endless talk, endless processes are going on that you keep compiling all these experts on top of. With all due respect to folks who are, you know, experts in their fields, we need you, but we need payments right now while these processes are going on. And there was also a misstatement by Mr. Lodginson saying that the folks on these uh, committees are not paid. They are, in fact, paid. They might not be paid a, a daily salary for what they're doing, but they are paid for these processes. And so is Mr. Lodginson's organization, which, by all due respect, you're in, you should be getting money for your efforts. But don't make it look like folks are doing this stuff for free. In the meantime, they're putting us on hold. We've been on hold for 400 years. There is already enough evidence where we can move this forward and start these payments now. $5 million is not a lot of money when you consider the environmental injustices and racism that has caused genocide on black folks, particularly those of us that are descendants of slavery. It was white supremacy that set this up. We are due payments now, and we must be considered a protected class. Those efforts that we're uh, including here must include us being in, um, considered a protected class. And notice there's no Indian representation. Excuse on me, this caller. Thank you so much for your time. Us they help um, us we need also. to move on. Uh, David, just to allow me to do a quick check in with the chair, the chair more in task force. There are 12 more folks on the line, and it is now 10 19. 10.30, cut off. David, next uh, caller, please. We'll now go to line 20. Your line is now open. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Lucky Aiden. I'm a youth organizer at PANA, Partnership of the Advancement of New Americans. PANA is a community organizing hub that's dedicated to advancing the full economic, social, and civic inclusions of refugees in our community. My work is to work with the youth where they create a space 
and advocate for their rights and um, create a table for themselves, their family, and their community members on policies that are important to them. Obtaining reparations will be an acknowledgement of the wrongdoings and the harm caused by the state of California's anti-Black policies designed to target and prevent Black, Black Californians from bettering ourselves. Reparations are needed um, so Black Californians can begin to heal from the generation discrimination that, and to break the chain of poverty and inequality. In addition to providing financial compensations, Californians must respect our humanity and we have our access to social service and publicly acknowledge the generational harm that it causes Black residents. We deserve a guarantee that these injustices will never happen again, and these are the necessary components to a reparation package. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you. David, um, next line, please. Now go to line 12. Uh, yes, my name is Calvin Morgan, and I wanted to say that yesterday I was quite disappointed with uh, Sean and Charles and that Charles Communication uh, Group. They are a horrible PR firm that represents the task force and the things need to be better. It's uh, embarrassing when Chair Moore has to correct, you know, sex discrepancies as, you know, errors and, and misspelled things that shouldn't be misspelled. You know, the thing is, no one's going to read a word salad. You know, um, it was said that what the task force is doing needs to be produced. I think to, uh, Chair uh, Tamaki has said that, or, or Task Member Tamaki has said that. And things have to be more visually striking. You know, we need reels, we need stuff like that. You know, these word solid stuff that's going on and, and all this uh, misquotes and things like that, this copy and paste stuff is not going to work. You know, I mean, we see stuff on social media and everything where thousands of people are responsive to you know, sleek design and other methods like that. If you're going to have somebody doing uh, communications for the task force, they got to be able to be more creative than that. You know, I mean, we got over 2 million black people in California. If uh, a so-called PR firm can't even get 50 consistent people to even pay attention to the things they're promoting, then it's absolute failure. So we just got to do better. And, uh, and, you know, the chair shouldn't have to deal with a sad attitude coming from Shana, Shana Charles when it comes to things she's supposed to do. You know, copy and paste and, and bland text on screen. We can do better than that. We need better creativity. We need better representation for the task force. Now land there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next uh, speaker, David. Uh, next line, please. Now go to line 25. Your line is now open. My name is Bobby Buss. I'm an assistant director to the Family Unification, Equity, and Empowerment Project that looks into the disparities of foster children trying to reunify with their black and brown families. Californians, black Californians, my family settled here from Oklahoma through the Trail of Tears. We have a display at the Metropolitan Student Museum in Riverside. Uh, there used to be the old post office downtown area, and so I'm fifth generation. My family was moved into Rivers, uh, Rubino area on a landfill. The cement plant has killed most of my family members. Now they didn't want bankrupt. Uh, we used to have wells. Now they're dry, or they say there's too much poison in them, so now we have to pay water. And I just feel that these, these repar reparations will make the difference in my family as we continue to be the difference for our children as fifth generation. And as far as my mother's side, my her grand her dad moved out here from the military. He fought for this for freedom, and he got out here and became a sheriff and he wasn't allowed to hold a gun because he was black and he had to stay in the office. His brother was uh, took and laid on the railroad tracks out here. My parents talk about how they couldn't swim in a pool until the last day. Like they pushed all black people. So there's a lot of uh, racism going on, uh, anti-blackness. Me and my children are the darker hue. And we're going to continue to suffer if we do not get the help 
and the service we need medically, criminal justice wise, health wise, social wise, and we're going to end up on the street. Thank and you. So Thank I you so much, caller. I hate to cut out. you off, but your time Thank is you. up. Uh, thank you again. Um, David, you. we have time for a few more callers. The next line, please. Go to line 36. Hello, everyone. My name is Iris Peoples. I am a fourth generation Californian who's been living in the Bay Area her whole life. Um, and my family comes from Louisiana um, by way of Virginia. And I first want to thank the task force for um, your vote on lineage-based reparations eligibility. It, there were specific harms that were done specifically to our people. And so I really, and of course, there's a legal standpoint. So I do want to thank the task force for doing the right thing. Secondly, I wanted to thank a couple of um, organizations for just getting the word out there. Those organizations are CJEC, NAASD, and ETM Media. I, the, those are the only people that I have been hearing talking about reparations and um, have been doing their part to like make sure the word gets out. Um, I haven't heard anything from any from the communication center, and that's actually what I want to touch on um, in a little bit. Um, and I also just wanted to talk about um, very very briefly how uh, housing discrimination um, in San Francisco um, impacted my family, specifically my grandmother, and cost her hundreds of thousands to million dollars in real estate value. I did submit her testimony um, to the reparations online, but I, I just want to uh, just say here in for the public hearing that she saw with her own eyes that it's on deeds that said, uh, do not sell to black people. So even though she uh, worked for the post office and was able to save money to buy a home in many places that she could afford, uh, she was... Uh, not given the opportunity because she was black. Two of my grandmother's five children had came down with cancer. One of them died. My grandmother still does live in Bayview, but if those of you who know San Francisco know that HP, Bayview, and Double Rock were like toxic waste dumps. So I would like to be compensated not only for housing discrimination, but for the um, discrimination in healthcare, and also with the environmental racism and environmental terrorism that our people have endured um, due to redlining. Um, and I know a lot well, of people Thank you say so much for your call and, and your information. The task force really appreciates it. I hate to cut you off, but time is up. Uh, next no, thank next okay. caller, thank you again. Line 31, your line is now open. Am I 39? Yes, sir. Oh, that's me. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Task Force. Jonathan Burgess here uh, of the Burgess family, pioneer family of this incredible state. I want to commend all of you for your hard work. I want to ask that you guys, you know, really look at the foundation. I, I have the same sentiment as uh, Reverend Brown of the task force when we talk about statehood. But I'm one of the few foundational families that can trace their ancestry back to colonial Virginia brought to California only because of DNA. And the atrocities that happened to my family and others with different last names. I don't know any other race or group of people um, on American soil that had, you know, cousins marrying cousins and didn't know it, and, and black folks with different last names. But what I say is that there is a whole lot of land from 1850 to 1870 that was lost. And without looking at that land, we won't know who that land belonged to, but it should be calculated. Let's be clear, there's no debt that could ever repay for the harms that were done to black folks in what we call America and California. Mm -hmm. But I would ask that you guys at least get it right. Karen L. Robinson wrote a book, Gaining Ground, it's there, of how much land was here in California. And I'd say use that number because there would be a number of people that don't know who they are because they weren't lucky or fortunate enough to have an ancestor to leave an autobiography like ours did. And so that money should be distributed to the greater good of all everybody else because I know about the history of California and Negro Bar, which was Negro Bar, and the unknown niggers that were buried were landowners. And related to somebody, we just don't have their DNA to trace it. So I'd ask that you guys really look at that and think about it when we talk about the actual debt that's owed from the state of California to the descendant slave. I land. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, David. That concludes our um, time for call in uh, commenters. So thank you for your service this morning. And, um, and just in closing, that concludes the public comment period. And thank you everyone for coming out and for calling in. And remember that you can always submit your comments uh, to the reparations task force at doj.ca.gov. And the next meeting will be in Sacramento. So with that, I'd like to chair, turn it back over to Chair Moore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Martin Walton, for your assistance, as always. Um, now we'll move on uh, to the next item on the agenda, which is special acknowledgments, and then we'll go to the tabled item on the agenda. I'd like to first acknowledge Sharon Whitehurst-Payne, who is a San Diego Unified School District trustee. If you can stand, Ms. Sharon, thank you. Let's all acknowledge her presence. Thank you so much for your support. I'd also like to acknowledge council member of City of San Diego, District 5, Marnie Vaughn Wilpert. Um, if she's here, she's not here yet. Excuse me, that was my thought. Uh, the next person I'd like to acknowledge at this point is Sean Elo Rivera, uh, council, City of San Diego Council President, District 9. And if um, Council President has any remarks, we'd love to hear from you at this time. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the uh, Reparations Task Force for the work that you are doing. Again, my name is Shawnee Lou Rivera. I proudly represent District 9 in San Diego, which we, where we sit today, um, and also serve as San Diego City Council President. Uh, thank you again. Um, I think it deserves recognition that uh, you folks are doing this work because of grave injustices, and the burden to correct for those injustices does not sit solely on your shoulders. Um, so I want to, to acknowledge that. I want to make it clear that no matter what comes from this uh, task force, that does not um, uh, undo the burden that the city of San Diego has to atone for the injustices that have occurred here by way of environmental racism, uh, of housing discrimination, uh, uh, the various injustices that we can see um, that have made their way throughout society have impacted the black community. Um, so I say that recognizing and appreciating the work that is being done, but also very much um, acknowledging that the work does not end with the task force, that the city of San Diego, the council at the city of San Diego has a lot of work to do to make sure that we atone for the injustices that we have uh, perpetuated on the black residents of San Diego. So thank you. Thank you so much for the work that you are doing. I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Ilovera. So now we'll go to the table motion. Uh, so I'll turn to Senator Bradford, the tabled item, excuse me. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning. Um, last night we ran out a little time and uh, we wanna come back to an item that uh, was on the agenda, and that was the discussion as to extension of the task force. And let me be very clear, when we talk about the extension of the task force, it doesn't mean changing the deadline for this final report. This task force and DOJ is on track to deliver the final report come July 1. What we're talking about is the implementation of whatever that final report is and having a little bit more runway for this task force to address many of the concerns that have been raised here today that have been raised over the last year and a half. And I think the best example of that is, again, uh, Task Force Member Tamaki, who clearly articulated, he spent, uh, he represented uh, the reparations and uh, 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 for the interned Japanese people who suffered during World War II, and that was a three-year task force trying to address about 100,000 people and that wasn't enough time. So we want to make sure that once the report is final, we have some time to make sure it's implemented correctly because it's a whole lot of moving parts here. And it's not a single person on this task force who wants to be here any longer than necessary. And let me be clear to whoever called in, not a single person on here is being compensated. So it's no financial benefit to be here. But I'm here to tell you, even if we kept this task force in place for 50 years, it still wouldn't address 400 years 
of wrong in this country. So let's be clear about that as well. And we have a whole lot of moving parts that have been presented before us. And I think we would want to get it right. But I'm hearing a whole lot of, what about this, what about that? We're here to address the atrocities and the wrongs that happen here in California. That's right. In California. And if we do it right, we will give you the roadmap, or we give the United States, our federal government, the roadmap to address it for this nation. And that's what is critically important here. Because if we err in what we're trying to do, it's only going to let all the naysayers say, see, we shouldn't be doing it on a national level. And we also have a fight, both myself and Assemblyman Joan Sawyer, to have a final report that we can clearly have time, with the help of this task force, to articulate to the legislature and to articulate to the governor so we can get it implemented. Because whatever that final report is, if it can't pass scrutiny and the muster of the legislature, it's all for naught anyway. So when I talk about extending the task force, it's having us a, a longer runway to make sure that what is proposed come July 1 can be implemented correctly on behalf of each and every one of us who have suffered a wrong here in California. So. Chair Brown. Madam Chair and members of the task force, obviously we have heard some very responsible, eloquent, and ingenious comments from this task force and from the audience regarding what ought to be and what must be done. And I want to, as a Baptist preacher, say that we need to have a movement from hallelujahs to do hallelujahs. And I offer now the motion that the recommendation will come forth from this task force that we continue to be the do hallelujahs and implement all of the great things that have come forth out of our deliberations. I make that a motion now in the spirit of our brother Bradford's comments. Is there a second? Okay. Thank you. So, I just want to, I need a little bit of assistance in restating the motion. The motion is to, can you restate the motion? We be the dual group. We be the implementers. So we be the implementers. Okay, yes. So the motion on the floor is that uh, this nine-member task force, we be uh, the implement action. the action-oriented implementer group, um, the dual, what did it say, dual lawyer? Dual lawyer. Okay, and it's been properly seconded uh, by Member Tamaki. Um, is there any discussion on the matter? I think there should. Just like <laughs> to, I'd just like to add a... Member John Sawyer. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, Member Tamaki. No, I, I defer to Member John Sawyer. Uh, Member John Sawyer. Well, as, some, as the person who originally authored this, and it was rejected by many people in this room, It's my understanding, and we, we probably need to table this, uh, but we can go ahead and vote for it. But it's my understanding from my staff that the window to get that done, or this done, in any way, shape, or form, was when I presented the bill back last year. And that there may be some constitutional and some administrative hurdles that need to be overcome. And so I would like that information brought to this body before we make that decision so you're fully informed that we don't make a motion that, that can't be fulfilled um, legislatively. Um, it, it would be not only, um, we just need to have all our ducks lined up, I guess is what I'm saying, so that we can get it done. Um, and I will also say, I'm still going to insist that we have some of the provisions that I had in my bill 
which may even further complicate it. So I think we just does need further discussion. But let's first start with the legality of this being moved forward. But again, um, this task force can vote on, I believe, can vote on just about anything they want. Uh, but at some point, it's going to have to go through the legal process of, of, uh, of legal counsel and the Assembly and the Senate um, to, to determine whether or not or the feasibility of this being done. Madam Chair, may I give, may I give a little John to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Jones Sawyer, for clarity's sake. For clarity's sake. This represents the spirit of this body. And that has nothing to do with the minutia of the legality of it. If our spirit is right, if our will is strong, there's nothing impossible. Amen. And originally you may recall that in your bill, it was a punitive section about removing people from this task force. That was the fact, that was the record. The there was not just one, there was two things on there. Not only about reconstituting who is chair and vice chair, because as we move forward, as Mr. Bradford said, you, you can't come with the same type of style now to convince people in the legislature to get this done. And anti-immigrant, anti-racism, all of that will not play well in the assembly. Imagine this. You look at everybody in this audience. All of you are non-African American. And the only black people are right here. That's what the legislature looks right now. Mr. Bradford and I have to have that owner's task. We're speaking to the cry right now. We're in full agreement that we have to give reparations to people, especially descendants of slaves. We, th th we're not in disagreement on that. But as we went to try to overturn Prop 209, we were using some of the same kind of tactics that we used in the 60s and the 70s, and it went down in flames. We have to have a new tactic to get this done. We cannot keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and expect a different result. What do you think people call that? That's a sign of insanity. So if we're going to get this done, because I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this done, and it may not comport with what you feel is the best way, but I'm going to get something for our black folk. Um, but that's what, at the end of the day, it's better to get 85% of something done than 0% of anything done. That was my intent in, in that, because this is the, this, we're not gods up here, okay? We can't have people belonging to organizations that have members that are saying racist things to other members on this committee or coming after it. I heard people talking about let's come together. Look, I put that in after being attacked. Think about that. I put those, I came to you to say I want to keep this group together. After being, if, if, if I didn't care, I would have kept my mouth shut and it would have died. They would, we wouldn't even have this discussion. They wouldn't go on. I don't have to deal with any of this. But I firmly believe in open conversations. I firmly believe that your, your voices need to be heard. These voices, whether we agree or disagree on anything, all need to be heard as we move forward. But there's a way to do it that doesn't alienate the people we need to have vote on this. And again, there's 80 people in the assembly, only 10 are African American, and, it, and it's 40 people in the Senate, and only two or African American, do the math. Can we get the votes to do that on our own with just black people? No, we're gonna have to have, get allies. Mr. Tamaki is doing a great job again in the API community, but we need to do more. And so that was the purpose of that, to ensure that when we move forward on the legislative side, I'm not hamstring, Mr. Bradford's not hamstrung 
with individuals who, whose perspective may alienate people we need to move this forward. That's what that was for. It was not punitive. It was about making sure we are successful. And if you don't believe me, look what happened with Dr. Weber's bill to reform or to get rid of or to bring back affirmative action and to get rid of 209. And that was a lot of money and a lot of effort. And so I, I'm here to tell you um, um, we need to make sure we put our best foot forward. And that's what it's about. I was never, again, I'm the one that started wanting to move this forward. But now I'm being told, yes, we can do it the spirit of. I had the spirit of, I, I want a new Cadillac, but I can't walk up into uh, the Cadillac agent and just say, hey, I think the spirit of it, I should get a new Cadillac. I just, that's, you can't do that. It's illegal. And if you want to go ahead and prove a spirit, even though it might be, it might be, I don't know, it might be. If you don't want to wait just to see whether or not it is legal, then that's fine. We can go ahead and do that. That's all I'm saying. We can vote today to move forward. But if it comes back that it can't be done, understand that I put it out there so that we can maybe even come overcome that, have a workaround, instead of leaving it out there for it to be sabotaged later. So. I call for the question, Madam Judge. Yes, Member Montgomery, so you recognize. Um, number one, if I, I appreciate the conversation because we didn't have this conversation last time, which was part of the problem. I, I think that we uh, all have different perspectives, but have found our way through a year and a half of working through them. And I think that would have been the same case with the last bill. Um, so that's number one. So I appreciate this conversation now. Um, a general motion, I guess, is fine, but, and, and the legislature, we can't stop anything that you all are going to do, so I'm not implying that, but for me to, to support anything, um, I would have to at least have an outline or framework of what that is, um, because I, I just don't know. And, and what my concern is that we, uh, I just want to make sure we're not using um, the assembly of the task force to drag out anything else that we have to do and that we are committed or have some sort of framework or strategy moving forward because we're going to have to have that anyway because we're going to have to lobby anyway and I haven't read it, everything that that all task force members have ever said but setting the eligibility standard that we have set as a task force and I have many, many friends, dear friends and allies that don't agree with it, but setting that forward is something that we have, have done and that's something we have to defend now. And we, I believe our job is not just to, I, I think our job is to promote inclusivity with what we have agreed to with the facts. Even the tax people came and showed us yesterday the numbers of how people who are descendants of enslaved people are at the very, 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 very bottom when it comes to any type of net worth at all. That's a fact. And we should be able, in this great progressive state of California, be able to explain that to people. We should be able to do that. Like I said, speaking from a place where I have some people who agree with me and many of my dear friends that I work with every day on all of these issues around immigration, all of these issues around the LGBTQ plus community that don't agree with what I have done. But there is a way to talk through those issues. And I think we all have the responsibility to do that. And I haven't heard anyone on this task force be um, racist in their thoughts. There's a lot of public comment that is for sure. And there's a lot of public comment I don't agree with. But I can clearly lay out why I voted the way I voted, though. And it's not racist. So I think there's a delineation there. We, we have to talk about that. And, we, and, and I, I hope that we don't go in the door 
already saying what we have to compromise on. We should be able to explain our position. At the end of the day, we should be able to. So I, I just, you know, this is the same, and, and I know, Assembly Member, you've worked on a lot of policing bills. It's the same argument. We have people that come to us in public comment, and, and they, do, they are at the police. They don't want it. They don't want police at all. But we, we know that we are not anti-police. We're pro-justice. It's the same thing here. Just because we have public comment that we may not agree with, we still have to be strategic about the way that we approach this. My concern is that we're... The, are, are, is the assembly of the task force for, you know, in perpetuity going to hinder some of the work moving forward that we have to do? That's my concern. I'm, I'm open to the discussion, but I have to know what that framework is um, before I agree to anything that is, um, you know, um, in detail. Understanding, again, the task force doesn't dictate what the state legislature is doing, and I'm not implying that at all. But I just wanted to get that out, because I think there's a, it's, it's convoluted, um, and we can be clear and develop allyship in this fight. We just have to approach it, like you said, in a different way. We don't have to sell, we don't have to sell ourselves. We, don't, we deserve this, this platform right now. We really do. So that, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for the time. Vice Chair Brown, I wanted to clarify, is your motion, are you saying you're not for an extension or you're for an extension? He's for, He's for You're for an extension of the task force. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Action. That's what it boils down to. Intelligent, respectful action. And we don't make this, need to make this a paralysis of an analysis. The basic point is, before, let's make it very clear, and as Richard Millhouse Nixon used to say, let us make it publicly clear. Brother Sawyer's effort, there was no discussion at all with any of us. And also, Brother Sawyer, you admitted to me personally and apologized that you did not say any word. That's all. So let's be clear. Let's be transparent. And we know what to deal with. When you're dealing with the assembly, you got to talk with people. You got to be respectful of people. But the point is, we need to stop being in earth, in earth, and like Jack and the Bear making tracks and get nowhere. Let's get some traction and let's move forward. And I appeal to my colleagues to express the sentiment of this body that what we feel, and since the public has given such profuse applause for the work that we've already done. All we need to do is to hold our hold and with pit bulldog determination, stay in the fight until the people get what they deserve. M Member Tamaki, you're recognized. Yeah, just, just a couple of comments. Um, to quote Chris Lodson, at this, I think, is a time to come together. And um, the people on the task force, you know, as a, an outsider, I'm not black, uh, but as someone who thinks that it's very important that we have allies to this movement, each task force member has spent literally a lifetime fighting for the rights of black people uh, and this issue. Uh, that's, you know, if we move the needle of public opinion, it's transformative. And so, uh, despite our differences, despite what's happened, um, the timing issue that, that uh, jo uh, Member John Sawyer is mentioning is a real thing. Uh, it's not going to be easy to get back this back on the legislative agenda. I appreciate the fact that it was raised. I appreciate the fact that... Um, Senator Bradford is re-raising it. Uh, I just want to re to add on to this and remind folks of what's at stake here. Uh, and one of the major reasons why we've moved forward to come to this point, which is very positive in, in my humble opinion, is because we've had resources 
the report that universally, despite you know, the fact that we, we've had disagreements on the task force, everybody agrees in the worth of that report. And it's going to resonate nationally, in my humble opinion. That was done by 75 folks in the California government. They're lawyers, but also PhDs, also outside experts from colleges and universities. Um, the resources to put these uh, hearings on, like here, get people out, that is all provided under the rubric of the task force. And on June 30th, we lose that. Okay, that's very significant because once the report recommendations are submitted, and I completely agree with Senator Bradford, uh, they're going to be submitted on time. The proposals that have been done are impressive. They are very comprehensive. I'm delighted about the, the work that's been done, in particular by Department of Justice lawyers working with task force members. That's going to be presented on time. But then it's really our job, all of us in the room, all of us sitting at this table, to reach out to our constituents and our networks to change hearts and minds and to let folks know of the urgency of the situation that's been so well articulated with each of the spokespeople. And it's very helpful to have those resources and a platform to keep the ball going forward. So I, I really appreciate um, uh, member uh, Pastor uh, Brown's uh, motion on this, and I think it's timely and well needed. I'm hoping that under the leadership of uh, Member Joan Sawyer and Senator Bradford, that it can be done and done in a way that is uh, provides the information that uh, Member Montgomery Step and the task force needs to have confidence uh, that uh, it will continue to be done in the right and positive way. Thank you. On that. And just for clarity, um, the assembly is not against this. In fact, the assembly is where it first happened. The assembly is where the extension of the um, task force first came through. So that uh, it's to make sure there's no dispersions on, on, on the assembly. Um, two, we need to also make sure certain that whatever whatever rules that can find, which I didn't know until yesterday, um, the task force members, when I asked what can the task force do, and the DOJ said they couldn't lobby, couldn't write letters, and I was under the misconception that we could do that. And so uh, we, we may need some clarification on what exactly we can do uh, moving forward um, so that we have clarity and we don't go out of, out of bounds or out of step with um, um, what the constitutionality of uh, what this body would look like moving forward. Um, and maybe it may even be better for us to act individually if you got more power to be able to get something done. I want to make sure we have all, that, all those facts on the table and that we're not making an emotional decision, that we're making a strategic, smart um, focus and direct decision that will impact what we want in the most uh, substantive way. Yes, Member Tamaki, you're recognized as a good point. Not to be lost, um, in our reparations movement, Japanese Americans, which is minuscule, tiny, compared to what's needed here, the commission set up by Congress to study this and to make recommendations was three years. And I could tell you, we, we needed every minute of that three-year uh, runway to do this. And so, uh, again, um, for what it's worth, um, it's one of the few examples in, in modern history where the government you know, made monetary atonement for a great wrong. We, it was the result of three years of educating the American public on this. Yeah. yeah, I think we can. Oh, sorry, I please. hear you. I think you call for the vote. Oh, Senator Bradford, did you want to? Yeah, I, I don't want to belabor this.
this because I know we have other things on the agenda. And again, this is not about reconstituting the task force. That's not the goal and objective. This is about, again, helping with the implementation of whatever that final re report states. And you're going to have to need people, and it's not fair to let that fall on the Department of Justice by themselves to make sure that it's implemented. And to help with the publication, as you heard folks attacking our comms uh, co uh, co uh, contractor. We want to assist in making sure that message is right, so we have consistency in that message. And that's all we're seeing, just having continuity, having a longer runway to make sure we tell the story correctly to the people who have asked us to do this work. That's all. Not about keeping this board constituting any longer than what we have to, just to make sure that we get it done right and get, get it all completed. That's all. Yes, Parliamentarian Johnson. You're asking for is to have a plan in place so that that shows that the task force as a whole is in support of legislation to ensure the success of the actions that have been taken, the proposals that have been made and approved by the task force. That will take time. So my question is, are you, oh, it looks as if we need to, or you need to, uh, schedule on the, the next agenda and have a detailed or somewhat detailed explanation given by either a combination of DOJ and the staff of the legislature to say what will happen and what is needed and then you will know what you are supporting because you want to support the legislation that does what you want what you've agreed by the proposals that you're adopting. Madam Chair. Madam Chair Brown, you're recognized. I, I beg to differ with that respectfully. Well, I'm asking uh, a question, uh, so I'm not... Well, we, what we're saying, we're making this thing compound, complex, and convoluted. All we are saying is that in light of the need for us to ensure that there's some traction from all of this documentation, that this task force goes on record this day stating that it wishes for us to continue for the implementation. That's all. One of your members stated earlier, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, one of the members stated that they weren't comfortable with voting even for that without knowing what it entailed. So that's why I ask if that's what... No, we're not dealing with specifics. We are dealing with the will, the mindset, and the desires of this body. That's all. Um, <laughs> so just entertaining the question that Parliamentarian Johnson raised, um, if we were to bring this up and have a plan presented for next meeting, would that be too late? Like yes, legislative sure. speaking. Turn on the mic. I th think we need to go on record as stated by Dr. Brown that we just need to take a, take a stance today to express our desire to, to continue on again to assist in moving forward on whatever that final report is and the implementation, the publication of that report. That's all we want to do, not to change any, I mean, maybe to change minds in the public, but not to no longer hash things out amongst this task force. Whatever that final report is, it will be the final report. But I just think we need to have standing as a task force for, you know, be it six months or another year to assist in the rollout. This will not happen. If, let me tell you, I've been in the legislature for 25 years. This job doesn't come with a magic wand. And this is the hardest thing I've ever had to work on. And we're gonna need all the help we can get. So that's all I'm trying to make sure it works. That's all. Holder, you're right. Yeah, I just want to get some clarity and specificity in the motion itself on the length of the extension. So are we, I know that initially Senator Bradford uh, was interested in one year. So uh, I, I, just when we formulate the motion, if we can give some specificity on how long we're asking for. I think one year is reasonable. Uh, so. You need more time, I agree, but we're only asking for one year. We're not going to leave it open like that. Um, did I see a hand? Member Montgomery, have you recognized? I, I just, um, 
some of my concerns are being addressed here. Um, I, but I want to know, based on what was presented in the last legislative cycle, is this the same? Is it different? Oh, if different. so, how is it different? Nothing has been brought forth legislatively yet. But what I'm only looking at is, again, just extending the task force, not changing the constitution of the task force, not removing anybody, keeping it constituted as it is today, just to continue the work that we have done for the last year and a half. That's all I want to do. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you for that. I, I, I just want to make a quick comment or question. Um, in, in theory, I think it's a wonderful idea. I think my only, like, Concern is that if we could extend the life of the task force, does that kind of send a message that we have more power than we have? Like once the final report is out, like we still are a legislative advisory body. So once the final report is out, it's really, really up to the legislature to to get it done. So I'm just like I don't want to necessarily send mixed messages to the public that like we have more power than we have. And then the other point I think is what Red uh, jo Member Jones Sawyer made in terms of like. If we extend the life of the task force, we're still going to be under Bagley Keene. We can't communicate um, in the ways in which probably would be the best in order to ensure, you know, the most um, success in terms of implementation. So I'm just also like putting that out there as well. And I wanted to ask a clarifying question um, to Member Tamaki because I know you're working on the public education piece, and I had a question. That that plan is to. You know, whether, let's say this task force sunsets July 1, the public education piece, that's going to happen after July 1, correct? Yeah, the, I expect that, and we'll put forth before the body here, uh, a, a public education plan that will go beyond the life of the task force, which now sunsets on, Ju on June 30th, uh, 2023. So part of that is curriculum. Part of this might, might be... Um, uh, not lobbying, but educating the public as to why, uh, what the rationale for the legislation and future legislation should be. Um, and uh, it may, may involve even some staffing. But the main point is we won't be around. Plus, we won't have the resources that we've had for the last year and a half goes away. So um, I don't know if that's answered your question. The, the public education piece is also kind of contingent on private funding, but it's still, that's up in the air, whether that, you know, the scale of it and all of that. If we can augment uh, uh, the effort with private funding, uh, great, and, but it is up in the air, but at least there's that possibility. And that, we, uh, thanks to Member Grills, we've had some private funding to assist uh, the task force already. So that's, in the spirit of that, that's what that suggestion is about. Madam Chair. Vice Chair Brownie recognized. Again, one of our problems historically, friends, has been the system has made us a cut flower of people with no rootage. And we ought to have the foresight to understand if other folks have had continuity and continuation, we as human beings, sons and daughters of Africa, should have the same opportunity. And we should not just be cutting off all of this great work that's being done. There has to be some rootage and some intergenerational and continuous engagement. Or uh, else... So now we, um, okay, so the motion is on the floor. It's been a lot of discussion. Um, it, you know, it may need to be amended to, 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 you know, incorporate the length of the extension I'm hearing during the discussion. So, I don't know what y'all want. Bradford has already given it to us. Okay. You already put it. Okay. So any other further discussion on the matter? Uh, okay. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Vice Chair Brown, could you restate your motion? So the, the motion is to support um, in spirit the idea of extending the life of the task force by another year. 
for one year? Yes, yes, ma'am. To end on June 30th? Yes, June 30th would it be 2024. 2024. Yes, ma'am. Or July 1st. It's July 1st. But this is, this is for implementation, Madam Chair, and not for a continuous study. That's what my motion is. I hope y'all will stop confusing this thing. No, right. that's why I ask you to restate it. I'm stating it again. <laughs> that period of that extension that Mr. Bradford initiated was for implementation. Okay, so again, the restating the motion. The motion on the floor is to this nine for the task force to support in spirit the extension of this task force for implementation purposes of the final report only for a year, July 1st, 2024. That's it. Okay, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. And who seconded? Member Tamaki. Tamaki. Thank you. Madam Chair, I will begin the roll call vote with the chair. Aye. What she said. Aye, sorry, aye. Oh, thank you. Chair Moore voted aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Brown voted aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford voted aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills voted aye. Member Holder. Member Holder voted aye. Member Jones Sawyer? Not voting. Not voting. Member Sawyer's, uh, Jones Sawyer is not voting. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there are nine <laughs> members present in voting. There were eight ayes, zero nays, and one not voting. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson, for your assistance. There are eight ayes, one, ab one abstention, zero nays, and so the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Nice. So the task force supports, um, in spirit, uh, the extension of the life of the task force by another year, July 1, 2024, for implementation purposes only of the final report. So the next item on the agenda is number 20, discussion and action item, advisory committee's final recommendations on potential remedies, remedial programs, laws and apologies for atrocities in the interim report, part one. Presenters, all task force members. So I'll turn to California DOJ to facilitate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it's on, it's on. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Moore. Um, I will note, so we're gonna go through uh, these, there are slides now uh, that are gonna be displayed that are going to show the top lines of each of the recommendations following up on our discussions uh, in the last meeting. The recommendations that you're seeing on the screens are the top line description of each recommendation you all have, uh, and was included in the meeting materials, a very lengthy uh, discussion of each of the recommendations that each of you have developed um, and written and come up with and work with DOJ attorneys um, in order to finalize uh, for this presentation today. Uh, so the plan for this uh, and the next agenda item after lunch, as much time as we need, is to go through uh, all of the policy proposals um, for you all to uh, review, uh, ask questions, um, and then ultimately at the end, I think like we did, if you'll recall in the, I believe it was the San Francisco in-person meeting with the original report, uh, at the end, vote to authorize Department of Justice to proceed along with each of the advisory committees to finalize these recommendations. At the next meeting, we'll prepare an outline, but we will continue to work towards uh, written materials that would constitute the final report, the recommendations for the final report. 
So for, day, for today's discussion, we do have uh, all, the attorney, all the DOJ attorneys uh, here to help you, along with Tony and Robin, who've been spearheading this team. They're, they're sitting here in the front row, um, who will be here to facilitate. Uh, but this will be a member-led discussion of each of the policy proposals. Um, what I'll do is I'll introduce the policy proposals. If there have been any changes, I will highlight those. And if anybody has any questions, uh, comments, or, or anything that they want to share about the policy proposals or any new policy proposals that have been developed that aren't included on this, I think there's a couple that we've been working on turning around quickly, we, will, uh, we can discuss those. So we'll start with the general proposals, which is a slide you're looking at right now. Uh, the first uh, proposal is California American Freedmen Affairs Agency, and I will mention that following on the discussions in the meeting last week, uh, we uh, have clarified that the intended recipients or beneficiaries of the agency's work will be American freedmen, also known as descendants. Uh, rename the agency to California American Freedmen's if Affairs Agency and uh, proposed having satellite offices across the state in addition to a main office and headquarters. Uh, the other things are, they're on the slides. I'm not going to read the whole slide, but I wanted to read what the changes were. Well, first, I wanted to um, acknowledge at this time San Diego City Council Member Monty, Marty Vaughn Wilpert of District 5. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support and your participation. Um, so this is, um, you know, um, a proposal um, from my advisory committee. This is also in the historic 500, nearly 500 page interim report that the task force released in June of last year. Um, and it is the proposal to create a California American Freedmen Affairs Agency. I will not be long uh, because you can find these materials um, on our website. Um, I will just read a paragraph from the interim report um, that justifies the creation of this agency. And you can find this uh, paragraph in um, the executive summary and the report as well. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And in 1865, the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution commanded that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. In supporting the passage of the 13th Amendment, its co-author, Senator Lyman Trumbull of Illinois, said that it is perhaps difficult to draw the precise line to say where freedom ceases and slavery begins. In 1883, the Supreme Court interpreted the 13th Amendment as empowering Congress to pass all laws necessary and proper for abolishing all badges and incidents of slavery in the United States. However, throughout the rest of American history, instead of abolishing the badges and incidents of slavery, the United States federal, state, and local governments, including California, perpetuated and created new iterations of these badges and incidents. The resulting harms have been innumerable and have snowballed over generations, as illustrated throughout the entirety of this task force, particularly during the public comment period, and to those who've been invited to provide personal testimony. So again, I won't belabor the point on this in the interest of time, uh, but the purpose of this new agency would be to identify how past state-sanctioned atrocities have perpetuated and created new iterations of these badges and incidents of chattel slavery and how to eradicate and prevent future badges and incidents from forming and prospering against the American freeman or descendant community. The agency will work with other state ag agencies and branches of California's government to mitigate any lingering badges and incidents suggest policies to the governor and legislature designed to compensate for these badges and incidents, and to work to eliminate systemic discrimination that has developed as a result of the, of the enslavement of the descendant community in the United States. Uh, the agency would be comprised of specialized offices and branches dedicated to addressing specific harms. Some of these branches include, but are not limited to, a branch to process reparations claims, a branch for immediate relief to help the most vulnerable populations within the descendant community, a genealogy branch to help with genealogical research, 
um, a civic engagement branch, an education branch, social services and family affairs branch, a cultural affairs branch, a legal affairs branch, a medical services branch, a business affairs branch, a data research and collection branch to identify and analyze trends in past, current, and future badges and incidents of chattel slavery, and a community support branch to improve accessibility, transparency, and public trust. And again, one of the additions is that this agency would consist of a main office or headquarters and various satellite offices across the state. The last thing I'll say on this is that, as the interim report stated, um, it really is the federal government, namely Congress's power, um, to eradicate these badges and incidents of slavery. They have yet to do so uh, since the Supreme Court uh, articulated uh, that responsibility in the civil rights cases of 1883. And so the state of California really is doing the federal government's job. Um, this nine-member task force is you know, stepping out and doing really what Congress has failed to do over hundreds of years. And so, you know, this is a this proposal for the creation of American Freedom and Affairs Agency um, is bold, um, and it's yeah, it's bold. It's it's striking, and um, it it really sets out to you know set a precedent and a model for what the federal government definitely should do uh, for the descended community. Um, so that's about it. On that, any questions from the task force members on um, this proposal and the substantive changes around um, that Mr. Newman uh, mentioned? I'll move on to the, I'll move on to the next one. Sure, and Chair Moore. Um, oh. Let's see that Dr. Grills has a. Dr. Grills, you recognize. Thank you. Um, kind of somewhat similar to. Is it on? Okay. Somewhat similar to um, the earlier conversation about extending the task force for an additional year. The hard work really isn't getting something passed. The hard work is getting it implemented and implemented according to the spirit of what was intended. That being said, um, I, I see the the benefit um, of the Freedmen's Bureau. I think what I'm a little unclear about uh, is the, the scope and the magnitude of it and the creation of what seems like will be an immense bureaucracy unto itself. And I'm wondering whether or not some of the things that are proposed here uh, in terms of the, the functions of the Freedmen's Bureau might be better handled by existing entities that are already set up and know how to move money, implement procedures, help people access things, and that the Freedmen's Bureau be more like a, um, uh, a monitoring body, an advisory body, a, um, an external report card body on the extent to which the state is doing um, the implementation as needed. Um, again, it's it's it's, it's, it feels like an immense bureaucracy. And that immense bureaucracy also troubles me in the sense that what will need to happen is a lot of financial resources going to that body that could be better spent in delivering some of the, the services that are identified and the programs that are identified in some of the policies that cut across the 12 chapters of harm. Thank you. Um, take that feedback and bring it back to the committee. I think, um, well, specifically for today's discussion, since we're from this point on is going to be the final preparation, if there is a discussion on some sort of significant change uh, rather than going back to the, to the DOJ and us writing something up and then being sort of too far down the line, if there are significant changes along those lines. And again, I, uh, this is all detailed in the 90-page in the document you all have. Um, if there are substantial changes to those proposals, uh, what we'd want to see is, is a motion um, and a discussion of whether you're directing the DOJ to, as a task force, to make that kind of modification in terms of preparing the final recommendations. What we don't want is to get too far down the line to an outline and drafting, and then we're sort of having to 
back up and significantly change one of the re recommendations, uh, which then would be a sort of domino effect. So if, that, if there is a, a, a significant change like that from what is in the document that you all have, um, I would suggest a, a motion and a discussion on the motion to change that recommendation on behalf of the task force. Make that into a motion. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me see if I can formulate something. Um, I, w I move that the uh, proposal related to the California American Freedmen Affairs Agency be modified to act as more of an oversight and monitoring body rather than a bureaucracy of programs that could, in fact, um, detract resources from doing the work as opposed to monitoring the work. Member Gross, um, is there a second on the motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. This has been properly moved by Member Grills and properly seconded uh, by Senator Bradford that the proposal for the creation of a California American Freeman Affairs agency be modified to act, act as an oversight or monitoring bo body uh, rather than um, a bureaucratic office. Uh, that may detract from resources um, to be distributed to the descended community. Uh, so, it, so that rather than resources being detracted from the um, addressing the other kinds of um, proposals that were, I, I, I had it more succinct earlier. It's just that last phrase about detracting money from the. The rather descendants. than instead of rather than resources uh, being detracted from you know the descendant community, uh, rather than okay, yeah. so it's programs resources and for services. programs and services. Okay, is there any discussion? Yes, uh, Senator. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, maybe future Senator um, Councilmember Monica <laughs> Montgomery Step. You're recognized. Please just let me be where I am. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Um, so, so um, I, I'm not going to support the motion. Um, I think that the intent um, is good, but the, the issue that I have that I think I've been bringing up over and over is that our systems do not serve the eligibility community appropriately at all, and they have they were based on foundations that never intended to serve this community, and so the issue I. I I want to hopefully get to a point where we don't have to have this agency where things are fair, but they're not. And so handing those responsibilities <clears throat> over to the current system, I think will defeat what we're trying to do here, at least for the next decade. And, I, and, and that, that, is, that is my concern. I know a lot of our recommendations because we are in California and we do have these systems that are we're supposed to help, you know, refer back to these systems and we will have to do that. But if we don't have, we, we have monitoring already, we have oversight, we have data collection, we have all this, it's telling us the same thing over and over and over again. I think that this is a foundational issue um, for the eligibility community and I, um, you know, so goes the board, of course. I just, I won't be supporting it because I think that this is, this is um, instrumental, especially when we talk about helping um, people get through the bureaucracy. Um, I think that would be the purpose of it. And I will also, because the assembly member mentioned this yesterday, Dr. Grills, you mentioned today, I agree that one of our major issues in California is execution and implementation in our agencies. That is a larger issue, I think, that comes from people who govern being more concerned about instant gratification 
than what it takes to run agencies, which is very boring, no social media, you don't get a news headline, and that is the problem. That's a larger systemic issue, but I don't want to sacrifice the agency that will focus specifically on what we need to focus on. Um, and then number two, this would still have to go through the legislature, so I would assume that there may be some modifications there and that we, if we go in the door already removing a lot of that stuff, we won't end up with anything at all. So I just, I won't be supporting it. You're recognized. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because that, that is the, the crux of a lot of um, agencies or agencies that we create to, um, I use the word monitor or EEOC or anything that deals with um, discrimination is how much power do they have? How much oversight? How much bite? What can they really, really do other than write a report to say you were really, 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 really bad? And um, uh, we've, we've been trying to give them some more, um, of, I'll use a word that was used earlier, punitive opportunities um, to make sure that um, agencies or individuals act accordingly. Um, and a lot of times there's resistance to that. Um, and so, again, trying to figure out um, not only the intent, I mean, this is, this is where we're going to have to translate to the legislature because they may look at it as another arm to just kind of write another report that sits on the shelf, another report that sits on the shelf. And, yes, you've identified everything, but what, what can they do to force an agency to, to act appropriately, and a lot of times um, um, systems are resistant to that um, because they don't want to be centralized, and uh, it, well, well, nobody likes oversight, nobody likes audits, and, and even though audits are really um, very important to very to ferret out where there's some, there's some problems. But uh, I, I think we need to, uh, or, or come up uh, with a plan or with a, or find a, an organization, an organizational structure that has this, this oversight that's been successful. We had that. That's been very successful at ensuring that people's rights are, are adjudicated and they're protected and, and then that they level the playing field. And I'm not sure if, there, if there's one out there. So that becomes the other problem. Are we creating something that's never been done before, which California does? Um, and if we are creating something that's never been done before, then we may have to open up our minds, not in a, in a prescriptive kind of way where we say everything needs to fit in a box. We may be looking at something completely different. And so what, what does that look like? And do we, do we need to, to, to brainstorm of what that looks like, which is where I think um, Dr. Grills is getting to. Um, uh, she's trying to make it work. She's <laughs> trying to make sure that it gets done and it, it's the most impactful. So how do we how do we do that within a state government that's so huge? Um, um, you don't want this Freedman, uh, California American Freedman a Affairs Agency, to all of a sudden get lost and on the shelf. And 20 years from now, many people don't even remember what they were they stood for, or they get knocked out of the budget and they're not formally in, in place as a statutory or constitutionally mandated organization. I mean, there's a, I know I'm drugging a lot of balls, but th at the end of the day, we need to, we need to come up with something that, that will ultimately um, do what we're, we're talking about doing, but making sure it has sustainability. And how do we do that? Thank you so much for that. That's really helpful. Um, I will just say that you know, there was definitely care and intentionality around the framing of this policy proposal. Um, in part, the, what you all are raising, the, the concern is that we don't want this interim report and this final report to just lay on the shelf. And actually, most of the, the reports are actually digital, so most of the, you know, they're, not, they're not even printed, really. So the, the point is, how do we bring to life you know, this, this 500 page report and who knows how long the final report will be. How do we bring that to life? And so the policy proposal for the creation of this agency is 
how we bring, uh, you know, what we've studied over the past year and a half to life. And so just to illustrate that, you know, again, there's great intentionality around these proposals in that for each of the branches, for instance, that are proposed in this theoretical agency, it corresponds with each of the chapters in the report. Um, and oversight and monitoring is baked into each of these branches when you look at the details of the proposal. So for instance, a civic engagement branch um, to help uh, you know, African Americans and descended community engage in politics um, from youth to adulthood, that corresponds with the political disenfranchised chapter. Um, for instance, the education branch where we're talking about you know, lobbying the state uh, for free education and free tuition for the descended community, that corresponds with the unequal education chapter in our report. When we talk about, for instance, in this proposal for social services and family affairs branch, right? to help heal uh, the, the, the harms within our, our black families due to hundreds of years of trauma, that corresponds with the pathologizing of the black family chapter of the report. When we talk about what's been stolen from us in terms of intellectual property and our, 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 our lack of our wa historic watering holes, right? There's a cultural affairs branch in this theoretical agency that corresponds with the ninth chapter in the report over control over intellectual creative life. We talk about the unjust legal system. That's a chapter in our report, right? There's a legal affairs branch in this agency that will help to guard the, the rights to ensure that not only the state of California, but the United States is fully protecting uh, the citizenship rights of the descendant community on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Um, that would be, you know, one of the responsibilities in this legal affairs branch. We talk about, for instance, there's a chapter in the report about physical harm and neglect. In this theoretical agency, there will be a medical services branch that is catered to um, the particular and unique harms uh, that the descendant community faces when it comes to physical health, mental health, um, and trauma related to that. Um, I can go on and on and on. For instance, the last chapter in our report on the wealth gap, right? There is a branch on the business affair. Uh, there's a branch in this theoretical agency for business affairs um, that will facilitate. Um, amongst many different things, um, business grants, um, interest-free loans, uh, things like that, particularly for the descendant community, folks who want to start a business. That doesn't really exist in the way that it should in the state at this moment. And so, again, there was great care and intentionality around uh, the creation of this proposal. Again, this proposal is in our interim report that we released um, almost a year ago. Um, and it's just been fleshed out more to make sure that all of the um, proposed agencies uh, fully reflect um, the totality of what's been discussed um, in our 500-page report. Member Tamaki, you're recognized. So may maybe I I'd ask Task Force Member to sort of clarify this. Um, you know, I, I think a Freedmen's Affairs Bureau is necessary. Um, and I, I appreciate the fact that it tracks the 13 chapters. That's very clear to me. Um, I also think that there are certain activities that are unique that are not offered now in any form uh, that the Freedmen Affairs Bureau would take up. Um, you know, there's matters invo there involving uh, genealogy assistance and this sort of thing. Um, but in tracking that, for instance, uh, I'm working on the, with uh, Pastor Brown on education and health care. And <clears throat> there's a series of recommendations about what the medical industry and hospitals and medical schools and uh, the California state agencies monitoring medical stuff um, need to do and need to change. And they're already sort of staffed up in that direction. And so, <clears throat> but they need to fix it, and they, they need to change it, they need to, to emphasize. And so what I'm concerned about is to the extent that the description goes into providing direct services that might be duplicative, um, and, and back, basically, you know, there, there are recommendations in education for colleges and universities to increase the pipeline of students that ultimately will become medical providers. And I'm reading in the outline that, that the affairs agency might be engaged in that kind of training and this sort of thing. So 
I, I think that would be my concern. The agency is needed. I hear uh, Member Grills, I, I think she's saying it, she's fine with that, uh, but we, we should have an oversight function. I, I would add that we do need to have the agency provide services that are not offered in any form now. But as far as um, statewide legal services, statewide medical services, statewide housing services, um, there are so many different uh, agencies and institutions and schools that are already covering those areas that the other that the proposals are, are making recommendations to fix. I, th I think that's the narrowing of the focus that we're talking about. Is that, is that right, Member Grills? Because let, let me clarify what I was trying to say here. I believe that there is a need for such a bureau, but it just it's too encompassing. And it may be duplicating things that are available and that could be better managed by our community-based organizations that have the expertise in a number of these areas. So for example, uh, where I get stuck is in that second paragraph, the purpose of the Freedmen's uh, of Freedman Affairs Agency to identify how past state atrocities have perpetuated and created, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we're doing. So I'm not seeing that that's necessarily the purpose. Um, I think the bullets that start below that, that for those first two bullets are, I think, definitely on point for what the Freedmen's Bureau should be doing, as well as the next two bullets on the next page. I think things like this, uh, you know, civic engagement and education and the social services, cultural affairs, legal affairs branch, medical services branch, and business affairs could be better implemented by setting up a mechanism to fund directly to our community-based organizations that have the wherewithal and the knowledge and the track record and trusted in our communities to directly in, you know, deliver those rather than create a bureaucracy that has to figure out how to do it, find the expertise, and then try to implement it across the state as opposed to going to our expertise that we do have who have not had an opportunity to see the light of day of receiving funds to do what they know how to do. I don't think that, and I agree with Member um, Montgomery Stepp, that um, existing California agencies have failed us in being able to implement a number of things that speak to our needs. I wasn't suggesting that things be left at their doorstep to figure out, but more that we, um, one, go to our community-based organizations and start funding our own internal structures that can live beyond the work of this task force and even a Freedmen's Bureau. It's building community infrastructure. And then secondly, that, um, Oh, that made me lose my train of thought. <laughs> but in any event, I think you get my, my drift. Yeah, I'll just say, I think that's important. Like, we, need, we definitely need to, um, you know, be in partnership with communities. But the, the, the whole point of this task force is to call into question the state's role, the state's responsibility uh, for the harms that this descendant community has, you know, and has suffered. And so to me, it's kind of counterintuitive to, yeah, we should be in partnership with communities to the extent that we can, but to kind of shift the burden of responsibility in that way kind of seems to kind of circumvent like the entire spirit of, of why this task force was created. Um, it's in order, it's, its purpose is to ensure that the state um, takes the responsibility um, and ensuring that this descendant community is cared for. And then to, to remember Tamaki's point around, you know, the potential duplicative nature of some of the proposals, I, I res would respectfully kind of disagree and call, um, you know, the particular um, proposal that you just mentioned in terms of um, the, um, the pipeline for black doctors that's mentioned in the consolidated proposals. You know, I'll just say the proposal, you know, it's, it, it relates to an existing pipeline to help all black doctors, regardless of lineage, um, become, you know, well, all black people, regardless of lineage, to become doctors. It's per particularly that program, I forgot the acronym, but it says CIS, African Blacks, Caribbean Blacks, and African Americans through the pipeline. That in and of itself shows that it wouldn't be duplicative to create 
for instance, a medical services branch in the American Freedmen Affairs Agency, because by virtue of the existence of this American Freedmen Affairs Agency, it's built to um, serve the unique and specific needs of the descendant community, of the community of eligibility. And so just by that very point alone, you know, it would not be duplicative in nature at all, really. I mean, that, that clarifies a lot for me. I mean, my, my concern was that we're, provide, you, we're charging the agency to do stuff that's not being done now. So it's really a question of scope. Um, the account, the holding the other states and CBOs to account, I think everybody agrees to that. That would be part of the Freedmen's, yeah. So, I mean, with that clarification, that's fine to me. Uh, Member Montgomery, so you recognize um, that when when something is institutionalized, there is um, a, a budget every year that it gets. And with our organizations, our CBOs, it's very important for us to partner and provide that. Try to provide that stability, but as CBOs alone, do not have that st stability to continue and institutionalize and sustain what we need to do. And, and we can set this can be a part of the structure to try to set that up. But CBOs are they don't have that that same type of stability. And what we're trying to do is actually change the system and institutionalize some of the things we're doing here. And I think that this is you know a, a better way to do that. Yes, Member Holder, you're recognized. <laughs> no, I got it. I had to turn it on before I started talking, though. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a really, this is a really important substantive discussion, and I'm sort of going back and forth in my head, so I really appreciate all of your comments. It's giving me a lot to think about. And I do think that there is a way to uh, bring all these issues together um, and, and, and come to a fairly simple resolution that incorporates all of the valid comments that everyone has made so far. Um, one of the things that I, that I do really like about this notion of a a Freedmen's Bureau is because it's very much in keeping with this concept that reparations and damages for human rights abuses has to create systems that end the harm, that cause the harm to cease and desist and never happen again. And it's also supposed to create institutions that make communities whole in the sense that they, they, they get you to, a, to the place where you were before the harm even happened. And so I think about the original Freedmen's Bureau and that institution and how it was interrupted and disrupted and how powerful it could have been and where it would have been today over a hundred years later if it had been allowed to survive and thrive. And so as I, I'm conceiving this, that's, that's my touchstone. I'm like, where would we have been today if that original Freedmen's Bureau had been allowed to survive and thrive? And that should serve as a guiding light for what we want this institution to be. I also agree with the points that have been made about supporting CBOs that already exist in the infrastructure and that have already created a certain amount of, uh, a certain degree of expertise in alleviating harms. And so I think we have to bring these two together. And so what I would suggest is just adding a bullet point as a recommendation to the legislature that this Freedmen's Bureau should exist in concert with the pre-existing infrastructure of community-based organizations um, and should the goal of the Freedmen's Bureau should be to support that in infrastructure, make that infrastructure more sustainable, and eventually to, uh, to uh, pass on some of these, uh, some of these 
uh, these some of these uh, things that need to get done to that infrastructure, right? Um, so it's almost like if, if, if we had allowed the Freedmen's Bureau to exist the way it should have, that it would no longer exist, right? Because it would have made our community sustainable. And so that should be the goal of this Freedmen's Bureau, to make our communities sustainable so that it goes out of business, not to create another bureaucracy that ends up just becoming as swollen as, as, the, as, the, as the current bureaucracies. Yes, that's great. And, and just to add, like, as she said, you know, our task force, we're mandated for our recommendations to comport with international human rights law standards. And one of the forms of reparations under international law is guarantees of non-repetition. And so that is in part why this policy proposal was um, created. Um, in the spirit of comporting with international human rights law standards. How do we get the ongoing atrocities against the descended community to cease, right? Um, and so, yes, thank you again for that, um, that thought. Um, so, any other questions? We do have a motion on the floor. And if you could, Dr. Gross, just, you can restate it or I can restate it. Can someone who has it written down restate it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. So the motion on the floor is um, for the proposal to create a Freeman Affairs Agency to be modified uh, to act as an oversight or monitoring, monitoring body uh, rather than um, as it currently is where it might, you know, divert resources from um, community-based organizations and other entities um, within existing the existing framework that are are doing work, similar work. May I restate it? Sure. Okay, and and I will try to synthesize some of the um, important contributions from um, the task force members. So, the motion, as I'm stating it now, is to modify the role of the Freedmen's Bureau to, where possible, direct resources to existing community-based organizations to implement some of the tasks that are listed there, while other tasks remain under the direct uh, implementation of the Freedmen's Bureau, such as managing cl uh, reparations claims, the genealogy, the tribunal, the uh, immediate relief um, to expedite claims. Once again, my train of thought has been disrupted. Um, so, so that I, I don't know if anyone got that down. Direct, yeah, modify the road of the Freedmen's Bureau to where possible direct resources to community-based organizations while retaining some of the other um, duties as um, illustrated in my examples. Is, is there, okay, you already, there's already been, well, that sounds like more of member holders, like addition of a bullet point, but it seems like the first motion that you made was something like entirely different. So I'm just gaining clarity on that. Is it in the spirit of her, member holder suggestion and just adding that bullet point? Well, I think her bullet point was exist in concert with existing CBOs and infrastructures. I'm not sure if that's exactly what I was saying, that exist with, in concert with. I'm saying certain tasks that are listed here would go, would be resourced to our existing and perhaps newly developing community-based organizations. And I don't think they'll be burdened by that. I think our community-based organizations have been struggling to get the resources to do the work that reweaves the social safety net that has been so tattered by various forms of oppression and denial of our community-based organizations to access uh, state, um, county, and city dollars. By the role of the Freedmen's Bureau to where possible direct resources to community-based organizations while retaining other duties 
um, remaining with the Freedmen's Bureau as illustrated in the previous examples. And there's already been a second. Um, any other discussion on the matter? Um, okay, call for the question. Parliamentarian Johnson, for roll call vote, please. No. Chair Moore votes no. Um, Vice Chair Brown? Yes. Vice Chair Brown votes yes. yes. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer? Aye. Mem Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? No. Member Montgomery Step votes no. Member uh, Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there were nine members voting and present. Uh, there were Seven ayes, two nays. Okay. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson and Task Force members. There are seven ayes, uh, two nays, and so the ayes have it, and the motion carries. So now, I guess we can move on. Um, Chair Moore. Yeah, sure. Member Scott Lewis, do you recognize? Could I ask um, a question to the DOJ? A question about the, the kind of production of the document and the and I understand the amount of work that goes into producing this and I'm just wondering you know if there's any possible means by which task force members would be able to see some of these drafts earlier even if they aren't finalized even if there's an understanding that you know even some of the task force members who are overseeing these various sections are still working things out um, it just strikes me that I think a lot of a lot of what we just discussed, I think, you know, and it, it was a healthy discussion and it's necessary. And I know that the job is for us to come and deliberate and, and finalize these 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 uh, proposals. But you know, and this is this is no critique. But I got you know my draft. You know, I, I got it literally. I think maybe five or six days before our our task force meeting. You know, and so. Um, you know, I think the, the ability to kind of digest everything and, and to think through everything um, prior to the meeting was, was very challenging. You know, I know a lot of us were just doing our homework, you know, last night and before, trying to get through everything. And I, and I do worry about us, you know, faithfully being able to understand um, and to, you know, to, to deliberate with each other, you know, without adequate time. And I, I understand that time is, time is the issue, right? Um, but I, I can imagine that, you know, had Dr. Grills had the opportunity to have just even see, and maybe she did, I don't know, right? I know I just, I didn't, right? Um, but if we had the time to maybe even see some of the even rougher versions of this, you know, we might have been able to provide feedback to the DOJ who might have been able to then share that with, with, with Chair Moore, um, of figuring out, you know, the appropriate mechanisms. But I, I think that would be really helpful, um, you know, because again, just for the audience, you should understand that this is a, a 48,000 word um, document that, you know, it's a hundred, it's nearly a hundred pages, right? This, this master proposal that we're talking about today. Um, I, I could read kind of quick, you know, you know, but it's still, it's still a lot of material to get through to synthesize and then to come with, you know, a, a formulated, you know, opinion on to then debate with our colleagues. So. Again, I know that the DOJ is working exceptionally hard, and I know that you know there is a desire to you know provide us with you know as clear uh, a document um, as you possibly can. I know you are also working under the constraints of our <laughs> providing you with information. I understand that, um, but I would have happily have seen something like even an outline. You know what I mean? Even an outline to say, okay, so here's where Chair Moore is thinking, so that way, or where her thinking is going, so that way we, I can at least you know, be prepared. So by the time I get this document, even if it is six days prior to the meeting, um, you know, I know what's happening. And I might have even had the chance to provide some feedback. And I know we can't use, you know, anything to, I, I, I know, this bag of keen thing is, I don't, we, we should talk about that. But anyway, oh, oh, we can't talk about it. 
You get it? Okay. I, yeah. Thank you. You know, I was a, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, but I think it would be really helpful because we have an immense amount of work to do, you know, between now and, and our next meeting, which it does seem as if our next meeting is when we will have to make our final, we will vote on the final drafts, right? And so I can't have that document six days before that next meeting, you know, and I think it would be helpful if, if, if we can find some way to, to kind of communicate through the DOJ with some preliminary feedback. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we completely understand, and I, yeah, I mean, you've, you've you've answered your own question in part um, with regard to sort of communications. All of this is public; it's a public um, process, and um, the task force uh, determined to move forward as an advisory committee, so that the advisory committees could could come back rather than, for example, having one designee who goes and just makes a decision on behalf of the task force. Um, so, because of the advisory committee, you know, designations. Everything does have to come back and be discussed amongst the task force members like this. We can't have you know, people sort of say to the DOJ, oh, this is my problem. With this, can you go talk to the member about this? You know, and then finalize it. I mean, we do have some ability to convey to members feedback that we're getting, um, or if, for example, any of you follow up with us afterwards, which of course you all have you know, time through February 8th to, to sit with this, provide edits, provide us feedback. So that is sort of part of this is we've given you the draft. This is a time to discuss these high level things and that's how we are using the time. People have a real concern about a, a, something at a high level. Um, that's the discussion. It's not necessarily getting into the, into the, into the deep details, but you all have until February 8th on your own to go through the details, review the documents, convey any questions to us. We can engage with you individually on all the in information. And then the idea is we're gonna have a detailed outline, which is kind of, so this is kind of the process we did with report one where there was an extensive sort of back and forth on the materials and, and they were considered and developed by the full task force. The difference is we have the advisory committees this time. So um, we're going to kind of revert to that. Um, the next meeting, the, the February or uh, early March meeting is going to be our sort of outline meeting. Um, and at that point we will have had all of your feedback from, from all of this. Again, hopefully by February 8th, you'll hear that from me at date several times. Uh, we really need feedback by February 8th from everybody. Week. Uh, what? Next week. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, I'm just, it's two weeks as opposed to one. I mean, I really want the, the, the public to understand. Just yeah, yeah. I mean, so we understand, you know, it's next week. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and it is a compressed time frame. Obviously, there is no extension, and, and we are working under a due date um, that we have. And so um, we're going to take all that feedback. We will then produce another uh, iteration of this which will be circulated to all of you, and then at the next meeting we're gonna have a discussion on those outlines, which is again not gonna necessarily be in the deep detail. Um, it's going to be making sure that we're taking all the feedback you're giving us in this meeting, the feedback you give us by February 8th, um, and then creating another sort of iteration of the document um, for all of your consideration. And then you'll have another month to the next meeting, which will be an opportunity for us to sort of finalize the document, which you'll be able to see the document, and then ultimately and provide feedback at that time, and then another month for us to finalize the document for final approval, at which point we'll have another month and a half um, where you'll have another, you'll have an advisory committee that's going to be designated to truly finalize, print, get the document done before it's publicly released. So this is the, the second or third time it's come back, um, and it will come back again and again, and there will be plenty of time to weigh in. And I think, well, thank you for, for clarifying that. And I think, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to reconcile is that, and, and correct me if my, my recollection is wrong, but I do recall there being some opportunity to make edits when we were working on the interim report. Yes. You know, and, and, and that wasn't done on the basis of us having, you know, a, assigned responsibilities. Because um, there was, you know, the total draft of the, of the interim report, you know, that was shared with the task force. Um, and we were, you know, welcomed to, you know, go through and read and provide edits. And that didn't occur, you know, through, you know, through public meeting. It was like, okay, well, the language here may not be ideal, you know. And so I think I'm, 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 I'm asking if, there's that opportunity, you know, and that was still very much a work in progress. And I think 
in many ways, you know, the task force was able to strengthen the interim report by having that kind of that kind of engagement as it, as it was an ongoing, uh, you know, work in progress. So if you uh, uh, look back on on report on the interim report, yeah. um, this is the equivalent of the first time you all saw the drafts of the interim report. Um, the difference between this process and the last process is, in the last process we were drafting it with experts, there was some consultation informally, um, and we drafted up these sort of lengthy, you know, chapters, which you all saw in their draft form. And that was the first vote that you took mm -hmm. um, on, the, on the interim report. And then we came back with outlines that really got down to what we were really going to finalize, and then you saw the final report. The difference here, like I said, is, the, is that you all are really, you know, have rolled up your sleeves and have gotten mm -hmm. into the drafting of the proposals, and they represent all of your concepts and ideas, and uh, as opposed to the first report okay. was really objective facts, just okay. a reciting of, of objective facts. So it's a little more difficult in this phase because it is the opinions of nine people, right. you know, really kind of hum brought together in a, in a, is a, always a challenge. And hashing through those in the open meetings is tough. That's the, unless we were to have uh, subcommittee meetings mm -hmm. um, where different proposals were really hashed out in those meetings in detail. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, this is the process. But I, you know, um, analogizing to the, to the first report, this is really that first time you all gotcha. saw prose, you know, mm -hmm. that you were editing. Um, and so that's what we're asking for, your edits by February 8th. And then, like I said, you'll have more opportunities. Right. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, and because I'm very sympathetic, you know, to, to Dr. Grill's position on trying to, you know, if you have, you know, less than a week to get through a report, to then take in the recommendation, to then go away, and then come up even with a counter recommendation or a modification, modified recommendation and I mean and we could see it even in the challenge of crafting the motion it is it, we're, you know literally trying to figure it out right now and I think you know just given the stakes of what <laughs> this report is I think whatever we can do and I mean that's what I'm really getting at like if we can think about any potential way you know if if it's if it's if it doesn't if it doesn't you know breach any appropriate code of, of, of ethics or conduct to even see an earlier draft just so I know a week earlier, you know what I mean? Even, you know, I think just with the process of synthesizing and understanding what's happening, just that earlier awareness would just be much, much, much appreciated, if it's possible. We can, we can uh, work on circulating rougher, dra rougher drafts earlier on, yeah. if, that would, if that would help. It'd be rougher. I mean, maybe I mean not. that's fine. You know, I'm a professor. I, I see terrible writing all of the time. You know, that's fine. There's and no, I do it no too, terrible so writing in the No, DOJ. no, but I mean, like, you know, I mean, you know. Further. You haven't seen my thing yet, so you know you have to wait. But, um, but yeah, I would appreciate that, and I hope the task force members, you know, don't mind me, you know, asking if maybe I, we could see earlier drafts of, of, of some of your your your, uh, your chapters. I'd appreciate it. Okay, so it's twelve oh seven. Time check. Lunch is for twelve fifteen. Uh, the DOJ, you can proceed to the next one. Okay, uh, if there's no other, just want to c close out the general proposals. We're going next to um, the enslavement chapter, which is Chair Moore, it's your chapter. Um, and I will just note uh, that the uh, only change in, this, in these proposals from the last meeting is the addition of proposals I and J. So Chair Moore, I don't know if you want to say anything on those. Oh, yes. Uh, so the initial, the additional proposals um, are to accelerate scheduled closures of identified California state prisons, commit to closing 10 California state prisons over the next five years, savings should be redirected to the American Freedom Affairs Agency and to reuse of the facilities, and then the other uh, addition is prohibiting private prisons from benefiting from contracts with CDCR to provide reentry services to incarcerated or paroled in individuals. Um, I come from, I, I listened or attended to uh, the California Budget Committee's uh, presentation on um, the fact that the state is in a budget deficit, and actually one of the recommendations coming out of that committee uh, were that um, the state, um, which is already uh, closing two prisons um, within the next few years, um, the, 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 the committee recommended that actually um, more prisons be closed, 
Um, and so if you look at the consolidated proposals, you'll see the sources uh, for both of these proposals. Any questions? Uh, Member Jones, where you're recognized. Uh, all the years that I've been in the, in the assembly, I've been working on closing as many prisons as possible. And we've gotten to a point where we, uh, uh, much to the consternation of CDCR, we've got to a point where we've identified about 10 prisons. Uh, five of them are going to be closed fairly soon. Um, we're estimating over the next five years, there's probably going to be about $200 million worth of savings just from prison closing. Um, I'm recommending that that money go to programs for, to end the school to prison pipeline, um, programs that help kids in, in our communities um, from getting into gangs and, and, and ultimately continue to reduce the number of people that are going into, into prison. And then to look at the savings that we got from closing prisons and, and ending recidivism, for every dollar, I believe for every dollar we spend, we probably save the state $10. And that every year when we do our budget, we automatically look at that audit, look at it how much, and then we, we give 50% of that back to programs that help our community and uh, to, to, to avoid putting more and more um, African Americans into, into prisons. And so I just wanted, just out of full disclosure, um, uh, I'm glad we have that in there. Um, I'm glad we're recognizing that, that California is closing prisons. We, we've been building prisons like crazy. We've never, and I mean never, never, never in the history of California have closed prisons. And the fact that we have 10 on, on the block that we can is, a, is an amazing thing. And I just want to make sure that the savings comes back to us and, and not necessarily go into the general fund where God knows that money will be spent. Yes. Any other comments on these two points or the entirety of the enslavement policy proposal section? I have. Oh, sorry. Member Groves, you're recognized. Yeah, I, I like the addition of um, points I and J. Um, and really like what um, member Joan Sawyer was sharing about the financial implications of the closures. I just had a uh, question for clarification. Um, with the closures, one of the other things that was suggested in item I was to reuse those facilities, and I was wondering if there could be some kind of clarification on what that means, because many of those facilities are actually in locations that are not easily accessible by members of our community, so what would they be used for? Sure, so in the consolidated proposal section where the, the sources were cited, ironically enough, uh, this actual recommendation for reuse of the facilities comes from a CBO, <laughs> come from a community-based organization, a very well-known one at that, called CURB, uh, where they um, are dedicated uh, to ending uh, mass incarceration and over-policing. Um, and again, you can just look at the consolidated proposals and the sources and read through the work that they're doing. Um, but the reuse of the facilities would be to transform you know, these spaces um, in a variety of creative ways. Um, um, so yeah, just look at the source. But I still not, I, I know, I'm familiar with CURB um, and their work, but I'm still not clear on especially given their locations, what they would be reused for, and is it instead an option to consider um, selling those spaces and using the proceeds to further the other work that's, um, that's needed? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Vice Chair Brown and then Member Joan Sawyer. Some of them could possibly be utilized for us to deal with these food swamps and food deserts where we can have our people engaged in organic farming. Since we are the sickest, our nutrition is not all together, and we have had 
land. In 1900, we owned about 18 to 19 million acres of land. Today, we own less than 3 million. Just you recognize. Maybe one of the recommendations that I will be making about using the, the former facilities is to um, lease the land to, a, to a, a tech company or a company, then have them pay us on, on a 25 or 50 year lease. That way we know we get revenue on a continuous basis um, coming in, and then we take that revenue to then plow it back into our communities. Um, and if the company's really successful, then maybe we have revenue that's coming in, not only in decades and decades, maybe in the next century. And so um, one of the things that we have to do is um, learn how to use our assets a lot better. And, and, and not, no disrespect to what you just said, but we, we have a tendency to sell it and then we use that money, then it's gone, as opposed to being more business-like with government property and lease it. And if uh, at the end of that time, we could lease it again to maybe make even more money as the rates go up and up and up with, with, with as you know, with, with renting property is going up and up and up. Well, guess what? Then all we have to do as a governmental agency is go to the mailbox and pick up our check and then use that money to help our community. Member Holder, you're recognized. When we're talking about California prisons, you know, over the last 40 to 50 years since the 70s, when the prison industrial complex went into full effect, you know, California built 30 prisons, right? And and, and one university, right? And so, and, and when, you, when you actually look at the prison industrial complex and what it looks like in California geographically, most of these prisons were built and erected in communities that were not black communities, right? So black people, again, were being enslaved in these, on these plantations, places. Um, that were that were environments that were completely controlled by non-black people, um, and the building of these prisons were, was used to create an infrastructure and to build power within these non-black environments that were like way out in the suburbs and beyond. So I'm thinking about this issue geographically, and. To the extent that these institutions are in these environments that definitely do not serve black people, um, what do we want to, how do we want to use these institutions to transform narratives, shift narratives, and make sure that the harm ceases and desists forever? So if we are going to keep these institutions and not tear them down, then they should be repurposed to some degree to ensure that the harm ceases and never happens again. Um, so the, you, you can use them to, to, to generate money for our programs, but also I think to re-educate the public um, and frankly, to re-educate some of the, 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 we need something to start to re-educate some of the people who lived in these environments that housed these prisons and, um, and start to really create a broader narrative shift uh, about racism and how it's in service of, you know, of embedding power with non-black people. So, uh, Member Montgomery said we recognize. Um, yeah. so, the reuse of facilities, and I just appreciate uh, all the comments. I, I would just say when we talk about certain industries, like we know tech industry is white male dominated, and 
I think maybe tagging along what Member Holder just said to the end of the sentence, as it says, reuse, reuse of facilities to ensure the harm ceases. That's a very broad, um, but <coughs> just something that would um, encapsulate it a little bit and focus it a bit to make sure the facilities are used for the exact opposite of what they're originally used for in whatever way it is. So. I, I left it broad intentionally out of, ironically, the respect of community-based organizations that have been doing this work for years. And so, you know, ironically, <laughs> is it really up to us to really define how it should be reused as bureaucrats and state um, employees, or do we just broadly put the recommendation out there and then empower existing community-based organizations um, to, to leverage that recommendation um, in terms of, you know, the fact that they're already doing this work. But if there is, you know, a motion that, you know, folks want to entertain to amend, um, that's perfectly fine as well. The hard part. Madam Chair. Chair Brown, you're recognized. Farms, such as Log Cabin, on about 35 miles away from San Francisco, of all that land out there, and right now it's dormant. Can you think of there being a Piney Woods school? right down the road from San Francisco. And you have, you have Oakland, even over the Pittsburgh where they pushed us out to. So we are close enough. We're not all way out somewhere. And the other bottom line issue is we still have the moral obligation, though it may be difficult, to convert these persons. We still live on this earth. We still have mass communication. And as the Negro spiritual says, there's no hiding place down here. Went to the rocks to hide my face, but the rocks cried out, no hiding place. So you may think it to be uh, too much an asking of us, but still we got to fight and have our enclaves, our little Egypts, our watering holes. But we got to be realistic. We are still on terra firma on this earth, and we got to deal with them. The last thing I'll note is that, again, in reading the literature coming out from these CBOs, namely CURB, they have acknowledged that some of the land that these prisons were built on have been built on toxic land. So in some cases, the, um, you know, the land, you know, it's, it's toxic if you, if you read the report from CURB. And so, again, that's why I just left it broad in terms of reuse of the facilities, because, again, that's straight from CURB, but it really is up to the community to kind of think about the emancipatory possibilities in terms of what the reuse could look like, taking into account all of the factors, um, environmental factors as well. Um, if we, I don't even know if we have the time really to contemplate uh, the full uh, possibilities again, because we're, we haven't really been doing this work. Um, but go ahead, Senator Bradford, if you had something. So any other comments is can entertain a motion to amend um, to codify or ratify what's there in terms of the additions would anyone like to entertain a motion at this time 
Uh, Chair Moore, I'll also offer that, you know, there's been a, a healthy discussion about this. Our staff have been taking notes. We can certainly work in the next iteration, which will be provided to everyone for edits and review. Uh, we can sort of develop that further so people can see what it looks like in writing rather than needing to do a motion or something like that. Okay. And please do that for the, um, the Freedmen's Bureau changes as well, because it's a bit unclear about... <laughs> What that meant, what that motion really means in terms of the implications of what's on the page already. Thank you. Um, all right, so we can just move on then. Okay, uh, so the third chapter on racial terrors uh, is uh, member grills. Um, and uh, in this chapter, um, there are just a few changes uh, expanding the membership of MHSOAC to add an expert in reducing racial disparities in mental health. Oh, these are new proposals. So I'll just, it's the proposals are, the new proposals are C, D, and E. Proposals. Um, the MHSOAC committee is very powerful in the mental health world in this state. But they, uh, from my opinion, um, have not demonstrated a real understanding of the mental health needs of our community. And the, the, the decisions that they make directly impact funding and programs that get to see the light of day. Um, and so at this point, they have not included someone on their commission who truly has an understanding about mental health disparities and how to address that. And then you see that reflected in some of their decisions. So uh, I, one of the additions is to add such an expert to try to temper or inform um, the decision making uh, of that body. In terms of uh, D, funding community driven solutions to decrease community violence. Um, one of the things that um, is, I think, important for us to think about is that community violence is a serious problem in our community. And one could argue that, to some extent, it's kind of what Fiere talked about in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. The, you, and the oppressed end up doing what he calls adhesion to the oppressor. You start taking on some of the mentality and the, the tactics of the oppressor and you turn it on yourself and your own group. And so we need to disrupt that and we need to understand community violence from that perspective rather than people blaming our community and trying to suggest that our communities are violent by nature. Um, the other thing about um, uh, kind of bringing this notion in is that, um, you know, we have to understand the context that we put the members of our community into and that anyone placed in those kinds of contexts will have natural survival reactions. So I think about the, the um, analogy of crabs in a barrel and how crabs in a barrel will just keep pulling each other down and will even kill each other if you try to repeat the action of trying to get out of the barrel. And that, that one could argue that that is um, perhaps what happens in our communities when folks go into survival mode. You gotta eat, you gotta have a roof over your head, you have to have a way to express yourself and be in community, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the natural behavior of crabs, when the, the barrel is an unnatural environment, just like the communities that are under-resourced that we um, live in, uh, is an unnatural environment. When you take crabs out of the barrel, if you look at some of the literature on crab behavior, they will actually help each other up a rock. They don't push each other down. And I think our natural instinct is to help each other, right? We are each other's medicine. And this whole notion about, you know, I am because we are, and Saul Bona, I see you, which means I have a responsibility for you, is our natural way. And so we need to then establish the context for our natural expression. And that means we've got to attack community violence. So that's why that's um, in, put in there. Yes, Pastor Brown, you're recognized. Amen to what Dr. <clears throat> Reels has said. And the immediate exhibit of that is what's going on right now in Memphis, Tennessee with those five police officers internalizing 
the insanity of this police in America that we are facing. Just think about it. It's right before us. Classic example. Beating that young man to death. Thank you, Pastor Brown. Um, the last uh, addition to this section is item E, proposal to implement procedures to address the overdiagnosis of emotional disturbance disorders, including conduct disorder in black children. Uh, and so that, that really is um, another kind of pipeline mechanism. Overdiagnosing our children pretty much sets them on a path throughout their um, experience in the schools and in the communities. And so we need to uh, disrupt that. And the, one of the ways we disrupt that is by doing a better job at the uh, diagnosis. And we actually have a problem of overdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, and underdiagnosis uh, in our communities. And so this, is, this addition is an attempt to begin to shine a light on that and to bring attention to changing that. Thank you, Member Gross. Uh, any comments, questions, additions? Move forward to the next one. Okay, uh, number four is uh, political disenfranchisement, and that is uh, Members Bradford and Montgomery Step. Um, and this is uh, presented uh, pretty much as discussed in the last meeting. Uh, I don't know if the members want to uh, discuss anything specific uh, with or raise anything specific with the group or if anybody has any questions about what's in the materials. Stuff you're recognizing. I'm just going to say we, we don't don't have anything to add at this point. I think this was mostly what we discussed at the last meeting. There was not a whole lot of um, feedback at that time. So, um, Chair Morris, up to you if you want to open it up. Or yeah, I just yeah. have one question. Sure. question. Member Girls, you recognize? Yeah. Um, I um, for item M. The uh, increased efforts to restore the voting rights of formerly incarcerated persons. I didn't really catch this before, but I'm wondering if there could be an addition to that so that it's increased efforts to restore um, the voting rights of formerly incarcerated and ensure access to voting for those who are incarcerated that still have that right. Um, we had to fight uh, to make sure that the county jails in LA County uh, allow folks to vote when it was time to vote, that they got the proper information to make informed decisions, et cetera. And it was only, be, I, well, not only, but I think the fact that our commission was shining a light on their vote, on the access to voting, that it increased voting turnout and voting participation by folks in the county jails. So we want to make sure that those who can vote, even though they're incarcerated, are able to do so. That's great. Thank you for that. All right, so. Uh, I should run your. Thank you for that as well. Any other notes? If not, we can move forward to the next. Okay, uh, and just uh, in terms of a time check, five was our sort of internal goal of if we got to five, we could break for lunch and then be on time. So it's up, it's your choice, obviously, but um, do you want to do five uh, and then break or? We can choice? go to break now and then resume at 1.30. Okay.
No, no, no. We just completed four. We are oh. on five. Well, let's just do five. Yeah, let's do the last one. Okay. Um, so number... F <laughs> we're, ju we're just preparing everybody. Prepare to get ready to go. We're going to hear all the shuffling of papers. Um, so number five is housing segregation and unjust property takings. Um, this was uh, members uh, Holder and Jones Sawyer uh, and um, for housing segregation and uh, members Bradford and Montgomery Stepp for unjust property takings. Obviously, they are related, um, but uh, all of the all the recommendations are as they were coming out of the last meeting. Um, so if anybody has any questions or if any of the members want to share out on their topics, the floor is yours. And like I said, if anybody has feedback on stuff that you know we're not raising now, feel please let us know in the in the DOJ um, and by February eighth, and uh, we'll we'll also incorporate that. I think Vice Chair, Chair Vice Chair was Madam, Madam Chair yeah. also in the area of housing. We need to include the adverse impact of lottery systems that have worked against African-Americans getting their fair share of affordable housing. The lottery. And we need to have something to help us catch up. So there's parity, fairness, and inclusion. Thank you. We'll make a note of that. Any other comments, questions, additions, modifications? Okay. So we're on track. Uh, so we'll resume for lunch and we'll come back around 140, 145. Thank you. <laughs>